Chapter Twenty Two of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Two. There is danger near. Women are strange. This has been said before, I know, but it is doubtful if it is ever said twice with just the same meaning, and it is always true. When Miss Jenrys learned that our guard was quite beyond the danger line, and that he might leave the hospital in a week, she promptly declared her second visit, in company with her aunt, her last assuring him that, while one might disregard Mrs. Grundy, when a friend was so ill as to be upon debatable ground, it would never do to risk her favour for a rapidly recovering convalescent. Besides, she said with a smile that was kinder than her words, in a few days you will begin to pay some of the visits you now owe to Aunt Anne and to me. And this he did. When he left the hospital, his physician forbade him to attempt anything more severe than a very short promenade once a day and a little sightseeing if he choose to do it in a wheeled chair for the rest quiet and much sleep as to his duties as guard even the lightest of these were forbidden him for at least a fortnight it is hardly likely that the originators of the fair city planned to do just that or realized at first what they had done but intentional or not the white city was a paradise for lovers those cosy nooks all about Wooded Island, those quiet corners about the lagoons with seats invitingly placed, and what snug recesses, too small for numbers, roomy for two, in the great buildings, among the pagodas, temples, pavilions, and lofty enclosures, hospitably furnished by generous exhibitors. Then there were half a hundred and more buildings, model dwellings, cottages, castles, villas, mansions palaces edifices state and national each with open doors and many with cosy parlours reception rooms assembly rooms where one or two could find quiet and seclusion in the midst of multitude and last and best there were the beautiful lake the lake shore the lagoons the skiffs launches and the gondolas on the first day of his freedom from the hospital our guard tired his strength moderately and took counsel with miss ross on the second day june came halfway as she expressed it joining him upon the plaza and leaving miss ross to my tender mercies for he had unblushingly begged an hour of my time which he stretched to two hours that i might help him entertain the ladies even now I am not certain that Miss Ross was not a party to the plot by which we first found ourselves alone upon the plaza, and a moment later saw our guard and Miss Jenrys afloat upon the Grand Basin, luxuriously established, because of the invalid, of course, in a canopied gondola, and looking as innocent as if they did not perfectly well know that their picturesque gondolier could not understand the least word of English. We watched them until they passed under the bridge of the bears at the south end of the north canal and when they came into the lagoon and turned westward as if to skirt the island i turned to my companion does she speak italian june no she is a good german scholar and loves the language she speaks french also and reads spanish well but italian no i am sure not then he does i declared and he has set those fellows to paddling around the island miss ross let us go and see the cliff dwellers and we went when our two lovers were gliding slowly along the shores of the island in the shadows of its western side our guard turned toward june and after a long look into the eyes which she dropped at last said softly and slowly june you did not rebuke me when I called you so at the hospital when I was ill. May I call you June now? Yes, because now you are an invalid. There was a little smile lurking at the corners of her mouth, but he went on gravely. Thank you, June. And now may I begin where I should have begun that evening when you sent me from you? Stop, please. I could not speak of that miserable time until you... 
i mean since you have approached the matter let me ask your pardon for the insult i then offered you i have felt all the time since those first hours that there was somehow a hideous blunder and now my reason has been enlightened i should not have doubted forgive me june don't how could i blame you knowing as i now do how you were deceived it is noble of you but don't ask my pardon when but i want your pardon do you think it humiliates me to ask pardon for a wrong i have done i am too proud not to do it mr lossing and so gliding along that fair waterway isolated yet with all the world around them those two settled the question of questions and then with minds and hearts at ease and beauty all about them their thoughts became less serious and she began to criticize the uniform of a guard standing at a boat landing with shoulders erect and a military air and you mr lossing are really one of those superb personages and to think that i have never seen you in your panoply of war shall i resume it to-morrow he asked earnestly for duty you are not able but when i am able when i donned that uniform i was in search of a new experience something to take the staleness out of life i thought it would give me a view of this great enterprise not to be had by the cash-paying outsider but june i am willing to dispense with my panoply of war and to be a common citizen once more shall i do you wish to your will in this matter is my law she laughed musically in this matter i am so glad you qualified that speech but now seriously let me say to you that if you choose to retain the place you have taken i shall honour you for it what can you or any man in time of peace do more or better than the work of these young men their work can only be well done by gentlemen courtesy watchfulness care for others help to the old the weak the children guiding informing protecting making this great beautiful labyrinth of wonders that might be so puzzling so wearisome so dangerous a place of comfort of safety of delight my friend when i think what a babel this place would be without the columbian guard i am proud of your uniform then you do believe that a man's a man for all that thank you june i do assuredly and if i tell you that i am a poor man with only a little money and just a newly fledged literary knack to stand between me and the sunny side of life what then princess june don't expect to exact one grain of sympathy from me because of any tale of poverty you may tell sir you don't impress me as a young man who has been ill-used by the world but that literary knack do let me hear more about that and her smile changed to a look of eager interest it's a short tale about a year ago i made my first attempt as a journalist newspaper hack would sound more modest and i am succeeding fairly then i congratulate you any one can be a millionaire but a journalist who succeeds he wields power beyond price there was one thing that bade fair to grow troublesome as i found myself giving some small portion of almost every day to the two ladies for miss ross as well as her niece had made me feel that my duty as well as my pleasure lay in those daily reports or interviews held sometimes in the dainty rooms upon the avenue and now and then in some convenient spot within the fair city at our first meeting at the north end of the grounds i did not consider the encounter with the turks in her behalf a meeting for i scarcely had a full look at her face while she did not as much as glance at mine but at the other i had appeared before her in propria persona and my subsequent calls at the house upon the avenue had been the same on the other hand whenever i went about the exposition grounds or beyond them in my capacity of sleuth i went in some manner of disguise during the first week of my acquaintance with Miss Jenrys, I had encountered Monsieur Voisin twice, first upon the occasion of our introduction, and afterward at Miss Jenrys's door, and during the first week of our guard's confinement in the hospital, I had narrowly escaped him twice, going to or from the same place. 
as the days went on i found that monsieur voisin's attentions were growing more marked and his visits on the avenue almost constant i did not wish to become too well known to monsieur voisin who was a keen observer for i was posing for him as a new york newspaper man and so at last i was forced to tell the two ladies that some if not all of my calls for a time at least must be made at unconventional hours and often in disguise and now the days while quite uneventful were growing more and more busy for brainerd and myself the matter of the diamond robbery after considerable discussion and some reluctance had been turned over to a clever chicago expert and to help him on and at the same time free our hands for other matters we gave him all the information in our possession told him our theories and suspicions and gave him a description of the brunette together of course with an account of her transactions with the emerald which by the way had been restored to monsieur lausch not freely and not willingly but because the dealer in precious stones was not daring enough to risk a threatened exposure in the newspapers to make the expert's way quite clear with reference to the brunette we told him also of her pursuit of miss jenrys and her connection with the attack upon our guard adding that we were fully convinced she was one of the clique working always whether together or separately in unison and we entered into no details where delbras and his other confederates were concerned in fact we did not name them we cannot let the lausch business go out of our hands without letting the other party into the matter as deep as we ourselves have gone said dave and the brunette has put her finger into the pie but there's no proof of any sort pointing toward the rest of the gang and so old man before we put another fellow on the track of delbras bob smug and company we will satisfy ourselves that we are not smart enough to run them down alone these sentiments i echoed in full and although they were proving themselves adepts in the art of vanishing and leaving no trace behind i felt for reasons which i had not as yet confided even to brainerd more and more certain every day that we should sooner or later entrap delbras and through him the others but while we could describe the brunette to the satisfaction of the keen young fellow in whom we felt a brotherly interest and any amount of faith we could do little more i sent him my shadow billy and the boy went with him to the cafe where she had been seen to come and go and to the places in the plaisance where she had more than once disappeared and having done this we could do no more save to wish him success and to wash our hands for a time of the lausch diamond robbery and the little brunette or so we thought but now i had upon my mind a new case our guard lossing as in imitation of miss jenrys and her aunt i was learning to call him was now becoming convalescent and while he had not yet returned to his duties as columbian guard which he had assured me he meant soon to do he was beginning to go about by night and by day as his strength increased quite regardless seemingly of the fact that he had been attacked once and had every reason to think the act might be repeated in some new fashion i had warned him of the risk he might run by going about alone at night for i saw that when he was not in the presence of june jenrys as he was now sure to be for a little time at least every day he was unnaturally restless i had learned to know him too well to suggest a companion for his evening strolls but i kept an eye upon him and so long as he did not venture from the grounds felt tolerably secure of his safety much of the great enclosure was as light and as safe by night as by day but lossing while recovering in the hospital had fallen in love with the lake so near at hand and his first stroll by day was in this direction as well as his first evening venture out across the government plaza along the shore to the brick gunboat and on northward where the lights were faint and the risk greatest or so it seemed to me he went that night and the next and the next but not alone when he took his second promenade lakewood the boy billy was at his heels unseen but watchful and well knowing how to act should danger threaten 
in the meantime since the night of the attack upon lossing the brunette bob delbra smug all had vanished utterly neither in midway nor elsewhere as turks or gentlemen of leisure were they seen by dave myself or the boy billy but they're here all right dave declared and if we don't find a new gap in the fence somewhere soon i don't know the gentry during lossing's confinement in the hospital after he had begun to mend i had brought dave to see him and after that he had several times looked in upon the invalid sometimes at my request and later for his own pleasure as well dave's bluff ways had made for him a friend in our guard and so one day the day following that of lossing's third lakeside promenade i asked dave who had declared himself off duty for the night to go and see him i had just received a letter from boston which made me anxious to see miss jenrys and as i had not called upon nor met her during the day i decided to go to washington avenue that evening go early dave i said when he had assured me of his readiness to go and ask him to put in the evening with you i don't like these lakeshore prowls the fellow's a good one with his fists but he don't seem to realize that it's treachery a blow in the back that he must guard against dave went his way and it being rather early for my call i sat down to re-read mr trent's letter it was brief and evidently penned under excitement he had received an anonymous letter from chicago proposing to open negotiations for the ransom of his son who it declared was at that moment a prisoner in the hands of desperate men in short trent's letter ended it's an alarming letter i write this in haste that it may reach you at once and can only say that my daughter and miss o'neill in my absence opened and read the letter and have written to miss jenrys in full i am very anxious to know what they have written see miss j at once it is important i have no time for more yours hastily trent as i was turning the key in the lock and about to set out at once for washington avenue brainerd came puffing up the stairs he's gone he panted and i was afraid you'd be do you mean lossing of course he laid off his regimentals one of his guards told me and put on a swell evening suit and away he went want me to follow him yes i answered promptly i can't come home with him i fear i must somehow see the ladies alone you know the place dave do you not he won't stay late you know i was not greatly surprised to hear of lossing in washington avenue for we knew well enough that his first evening's visit would be to miss jenrys he had been three or four times taken to the gate in a rolling chair and had walked from there to the house for a morning call but this was his first evening outside the grounds since his recovery as i approached the house i saw that someone was before me already at the threshold and ringing the bell i could not identify the figure because of the two trees which stood one on each side of the stone steps before the door the one half concealing his figure the other the light at the corner below the door opened so promptly that he was admitted before i had left the pavement and the visitor lossing as i supposed passed in poor fellow i said to myself i won't come upon his very heels i'll give him a few moments at least alone with the lady of his choice and i turned away and walked at a moderate pace around the block but i could spare him no further grace and so upon again reaching the house i ran up the steps and rang hastily the rooms occupied by the ladies as parlour and reception rooms were small and cosy and thrown together by an arch beneath which a portiere was draped and miss ross came forward to greet me at the doorway of the first of these i could hear a murmur of conversation from the farther room but it was not until i was standing beneath the curtained archway that i saw to my amazement lossing and monsieur voisin at the farther side of the room talking amiable nothings as men of the world will when they meet both were in evening dress and the frenchman held in his hand a splendid bunch of american beauty roses voisin greeted me with an empressement and lossing carelessly acknowledged having met me before miss jenrys her aunt informed me as she had before informed the others was engaged upon a letter of some importance 
which must be sent in the early mail she would join us soon and then i learned from our desultory talk that it was voisin for whose accommodation i had been pacing the block and that lossing had been the first arrival these two were still seated at the rear of the inner room with miss ross at a little table near its centre and myself opposite her and with my back to the archway when there came a sudden sound at the outer door it opened and closed quickly and miss jenrys's voice exclaimed oh mr masters i have had such a letter one of those wretches has written that he will ransom poor lost gerald trent for june my dear come and receive thy visitors before thee tells thy news there was just a second of embarrassed silence and then miss jenrys came forward and greeted her guests with precisely the same courteous welcome extended to us each and all but she only referred to her exclamatory first words in reply to monsieur voisin's question you greeted us with some rather startling words miss jenrys pardon me but is it true that you have a friend lost in this wonderful city but miss jenrys was not to be made to commit herself a second time not at all it is simply some news just given me by a correspondent who has told me in a former letter about the disappearance of a young man whom i do not know a disappearance is it possible i am interested he turned quickly toward me may i ask from you the details you can learn from the daily papers as much as i can tell you i replied with my most candid smile i read some time since of such a disappearance and speaking of it casually to miss jenrys learned from her that she had the news direct from a young lady correspondent who chanced to know the young man and his family is that reported correctly miss jenrys she nodded and he has been ransomed you say that is well indeed persisted voisin there was a brief moment of silence during which i knew that her eyes were fixed upon my face but other eyes were also keenly watching and i did not return her gaze not ransomed miss jenrys said not yet there has been an offer of some sort a proposition i understand and she turned to lossing and began to question him about his health and then before the frenchman could renew his queries began telling them both of a recent letter from her new york aunt full it would seem of bits of society news and mention of persons known to herself lossing and voisin and she was so well aided by her aunt and lossing not to mention myself that there was no renewal of the former subject and after a very short call monsieur voisin made his adieus expressed the keenest pleasure at having encountered mr lossing in chicago and his determination to see more of him when the door had closed behind him i arose and without a word of explanation crossed the two rooms and peering out through the little bay window overlooking the street saw monsieur voisin standing upon the pavement outside and casting slow glances first up and then down the street after which he walked briskly southward there was no need of an explanation where those three were concerned and i made none no one referred to monsieur voisin his visit or his interest in the trent disappearance and nothing was said for a time concerning the letter which was foremost in miss jenrys's mind and in mine for half an hour i conversed with miss ross and left the lovers to an uninterrupted chat at the end of that time lossing took his leave and yet he had heard but the briefest outlines of the trent affair but in spite of my own request that he would remain and make one at our council he withdrew declaring himself under orders to keep early hours i let him go without uneasiness for was not dave brainerd lurking somewhere very near and very much to be relied upon he had said good-bye to the little quakeress in the back parlour and then miss jenrys and myself had walked with him the length of the two small rooms bidding him good-night at the door as the street door was heard to close behind him miss jenrys turned to me caught my arm and said quickly beseechingly mr masters won't you follow him home i i have a strange feeling that he is not safe it is not far and it is early can you not come back please there was no hesitation no blushes 
she spoke like a woman forgetful of self in her anxiety for another and when i told her that my friend was doubtless awaiting him she only wrung her hands he may not be now it is so early and i shall not feel at ease until i know mr masters i am sure there is danger very near us i feel it won't you go and come back when all is safe End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 23 You Are Suffering in My Stead. It was useless to argue, and how could I refuse? For the first time, and greatly to my amazement, I saw that self contained and sweetly reasonable young woman, deaf to reason and in that strange condition which for lack of power to understand we men call hysterical i went and in spite of myself i left her presence feeling somehow aroused and watchful quite prepared for a little time to see an assassin at every corner and beneath every tree do not overtake him had been her last command it might offend him only see him safe at his own door I was not five minutes behind Lossing, and he could not, or would not, I knew, walk rapidly. I expected to come close upon his heels before I had reached the first corner. That he would take the most direct and nearest route, I felt, was a matter of course. In fact, he knew no other, or so I thought. This direct route was straight north to 57th Street, and east to the entrance gate, but though I walked fast and then almost ran, I could see nothing of Lossing and nothing of Dave Brainerd. What did it mean? When I had reached the end of the first block without a sight of Lossing, I hastened across the intersecting street and hurried on another block, and still no Lossing. I paused, looked around me, and seeing and hearing nothing, increased my steps almost to a run. At 57th Street I paused before turning to look about me and to listen After the first block going east this street became quite densely shaded by trees on either side I Had now reached the second block on the south side of the street that which contained the vacant lots and the overshadowing trees Beneath which the boot black stand was placed by day and here again I paused and listened in the hope that in the quiet about me I might hear and recognize Lossing's slow, even step. But no step was heard, and I moved on. It is early yet, I assured myself, so early that thugs and night-birds are hardly likely to be abroad. I was now opposite the boot-black sand on the skeleton uprights which supported his rainy day awning, and the platform upon which his patrons sat enthroned in state. And here, memory fails me i had turned my gaze upon the gibbet like uprights and simultaneously as it now seems to me a voice shouted my name but the sound and something else came together something bringing with it a sting and the sounds of a rampant engine i saw a myriad of flashing lights heard a tremendous crash and that was all i came to myself a little later outstretched upon a wire cot and with a cretonne cushion beneath what felt like a very large and much battered prize pumpkin but what was in reality my head there was a glow of electric light all about and above me and bottles of all sizes and colours on every side slowly it dawned upon my dazed senses that i was in the corner drug store where i had more than once called on my return from washington avenue to buy a cigar I stirred slightly and then the faces of Dave Brenard Lossing the druggist and a big policeman came suddenly into view surrounding my cot Hello old man glad to see you back was Dave's characteristic greeting and the druggist who proved to be a physician as well Promptly placed a finger on my pulse Better he said laconically and turning took from the desk at his back a glass which he held before me can you lift your head and drink this he asked I made a feeble effort and with Dave's assistance 
got my head high enough to swallow the medicine now said the surgeon lie still and i think before long you will be all right except for a sore head which you will probably keep for a day or two for some time longer i lay quiet and with no desire to think or speak then slowly the noise and dizziness wore away and the strength came back to my limbs but when i attempted to rise i found that my head was paining me severely and i contented myself with resting upon my elbow and asking with my eyes on dave what has happened sandbag replied dave tersely didn't you feel it i feel it now i said trying to smile feebly for i knew that dave now assured that my hurt was not serious was giving vent to his relief in a characteristic bit of chaff you see it was this way he went on lossing here and i were walking along on the north side of the street just down here and we saw you cross the street on the opposite side the lamp at the corner showed you plainly we saw you stop and look and seem to listen and then go on and repeat the same manoeuvre after you had crossed the street we had stopped under a tree and close against the wall nearly opposite that bootblack stand and we meant to cross and surprise you when all at once out from behind that platform sprang someone i gave a yell and we heard you go down i ran to you and lossing ran and fired after the fellow who cut across the open ground i called him back when i saw that you were insensible and the next minute this officer came up he ran to this place lucky it is so near and brought the cot and here you are can you remember did you hear me call yes i said slowly i i think i tried to turn and that saved you no doubt declared the druggist the fellow meant to do you deadly hurt the weapon shows that he meant to strike you lower across the back of the neck but at the call you turned just as he had taken aim and as a result you received the blow on the back of the skull the thickest part and it struck with less than half its force glancing away as your head moved sideways it was most fortunate for you and now as i began to think and remember i knew that miss jenrys would be waiting anxiously and that delay would mean for her in the mood in which i had left her a time of terrible suspense i brought myself to a sitting posture and then got upon my feet rather weakly the druggist touched my wrist again if you'll take my advice he said you will stay right here for the night i have the comfortable room at the back here and i think by keeping up an application during the night a cooling and healing lotion that will keep out inflammation you will come out in the morning with nothing worse than a sore and tender skull to show for your encounter i am a regular physician you'll be quite safe with me i accepted his courtesy as frankly as he had proffered it and then while he busied himself preparing the cooling lotion i told dave how i had promised to return and that miss jenrys must not be kept longer in expectation i did not tell him why i had left the house to regain again so soon and dave was not the man to question tell her i said that all is right she will understand and later i will explain to you and tell her i find that i must delay the reading of that letter until tomorrow morning that it is a purely personal matter that detains me and that i will explain when we meet he got up to go and i turned to lossing who with the tact so natural to him had gone to the front of the long room and was idly turning the leaves of a directory dave is about to do the thing i failed to do because of this sore head i said to him i wish you would stay with me until he comes back he won't be long he seated himself without a question and while dave was gone and my host busy in preparing for my comfort he talked lightly of this and that and finally of my unknown assailant i believe i hit him somewhere he said for i heard him drop an oath as he ran and by the way he dropped something else too what was that he got up and went to the place where the policeman had been sitting until assured that he could do nothing then he had gone out with dave declaring his intention to go and look over the ground a speech which caused dave to smile behind his hat from the floor close against the wall lossing took up something which he brought forward and laid beside me upon the cot 
it was a bar of iron at least four inches in circumference and encased in a length of rubber tubing which was tied tightly over each end that he said is the weapon and if it had struck you fairly it would have been your death i held it in my hand a death-dealing weapon indeed and i shuddered as i put it down asking myself meanwhile was it meant for me but for you i said aloud you and brain ed don't he put up his hand quickly when i think of what you have done for me and i i fear you are suffering now in my stead it was the echo of my own thought and i was glad to see my host reappear thus cutting short the subject which i was glad to drop just then the next morning found me somewhat the worse for my adventure yet thankful to find that i could go about my day's business a little stiffened from my fall a trifle weaker than usual and with an aching and somewhat misshapen head but a detective learns to bear occasional hard knocks with fortitude and i was thankful to be out of the affair so easily as an evidence of my dazed condition of the night before was the fact that i had not once thought to ask how dave and lossing chanced to be so near me at my time of need it was one of my first thoughts and questions in the morning however you see explained dave i had not looked for any one quite so early but i had stationed myself very near on the side of the street opposite the house and was pacing up and down keeping the place in sight i had a half dozen cigars and a pocket full of matches and when i wanted to turn if anyone was in sight i stopped and wasted a couple of minutes trying to light my cigar see distinctly well of course i looked to see our friend come out and go north and so while i was just on the turn i was a little upset to see someone come out of miss jay's door and turn square south of course i went south too and to carry out your plan I being nearer the south crossing than he turned and crossed in order to meet him and all ready to be properly surprised at the encounter you know according to orders well sir we met right at the opposite corner and instead of our man there was a tall dark well-dressed person who hastened his steps a bit in passing me he stopped as if for an explanation it was voisin i said the frenchman i told you of hm i thought as much well i stopped to light my cigar and the frenchman turned on the east side of the street and went back the way he came i on my side did likewise at the north end of the block he turned again this time without crossing and i did likewise i didn't try to keep shady for i thought it began to look like a game of freeze out and i kept the west side of the street as might have been expected after two or three turns he left the field at the south end of the block going east and very soon after your man came out and turned south which surprised me a little he walked very fast but i caught up and tackled him calling him by your name and then apologizing and explaining that knowing you were to call upon miss j i had been on the lay for you having a matter of business to impart as promptly as possible do you think he suspected us not then he told me very delicately that he had left early feeling sure that you had some matter of importance to discuss with the ladies and added his fear that you would not appear for some time yet of course i gave up all idea of waiting and went with him and to pass the time and make myself agreeable i told him about the other fellow what do you call him voisin yes voisin we had reached the south corner where voisin had turned east and lossing was walking briskly at the corner he turned to me and proposed taking the longest route home by going over to madison avenue in fact he felt like walking he said it was this queer route that set me to telling him about voisin's promenade and i wound up by wondering if you would take a new route too at that he took my arm and let me know in that polite way of his that he suspected our little game that he knew how anxious you were for his safety and that he appreciated your interest but says he don't you see that if there is danger abroad tonight it is masters who runs the risk i saw that he was really uneasy and so when he proposed that we should hasten on to fifty seventh street and go down past miss generous's once more i agreed thinking i will admit that it was a sort of fool's errand 
well sir we had been walking at a brisk pace and were halfway down the block between the avenues when we saw a figure start out from the corner beyond and run across the street we were almost at the corner and to avoid the light just there we crossed the street and went along in the shadow of the trees and buildings past the light and on to the opposite corner we had just reached it and had stopped to look and listen for the skulkers when we saw you come into the light stop look about and seem to listen he's after that fellow i whispered to lossing let's keep quiet and be ready to lend a hand we could just see the fellow jump out at you it's lucky the night was so clear the shade was so thick just there end of chapter 23chapter 24 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter 24 it is our first clue miss jenrys met me that morning almost at the threshold she had passed a restless night for my message had not wholly allayed her fear and she did not conceal the fact i have been very anxious were her first words perhaps i have been foolish but somehow i seem to have got into a new world and i might very well pose for a brighton heroine i believe i am growing hysterical what with my own little mystery which seems to have stepped into the background happily for me and all the bigger mysteries but there breaking into a nervous laugh i can hold my tongue now tell me what happened last night oh catching my look of surprise something happened i know i felt it she was indeed woefully nervous but to withhold anything would only increase the strain so i told her as briefly as possible the story of my encounter and the part played in it by lossing and dave but i did not speak of dave's meeting with monsieur voisin and i hardly needed to tell her how it happened that my friend and lossing were so fortunately at hand i am not surprised she said when i had told my story but i am oh so thankful that you escaped with nothing worse i felt sure there was danger and i urged you into it but if you had not gone i feel certain it would have been worse she talked on in this strain for some moments and it was plain to me though she did not put the thoughts into words that she believed the attack was meant for lossing and not for myself suddenly she sprang up i am forgetting poor gerald trent she exclaimed and crossing the room unlocked her desk took out the letter and placed it in my hands it was a long letter full of lamentations and repetitions telling the story in a rambling exclamatory hysterical fashion the letter of a young girl a stranger to sorrow and its discipline who finds herself suddenly plunged into a labyrinth of fear terror suspense loving much and tortured through that love and her story was briefly this mr trent had seized the opportunity afforded by the change in his wife's condition which while neither really better nor worse was much quieter in fact wrote miss o'neill while she does not recognize any of us she constantly fancies us all about her and she talks to him in such a low pathetic pitiful tone half an hour at a time and then drops into a doze only to wake up and begin over again she does not know us and while in this state dr lane says she is better alone with the nurse this being the case mr trent had left home for a day to look after some long neglected business matter and in his absence the letter had arrived it was addressed to mr trent in a strange hand a woman's hand it would seem and it was from chicago they had waited in anxious suspense until chancing to think that it might be an important message and a prompt answer required miss trent had after some hesitation opened the letter a copy of which was at this point inserted it ran thus beginning with mr trent's full name and correct address sir in writing this i am perhaps risking my own life as your son's is risked every day that he passes a prisoner in a place where he is as safely hidden as if he were already out of the world not only is your boy a prisoner but he is a sick man your advertised rewards have been read and laughed at 
the men who have him in charge are no common criminals they mean to secure a fortune in return for young trent they know that his father is a millionaire and his sweetheart an heiress in her own right it is in my power as one of the party in possession to release your son i waste no time in platitudes but state frankly here my object in thus addressing you i wish to leave the clique for reasons of my own and to do this i must have money this is why i propose to help you for a consideration the clique will take no less than a modest fortune hundreds of thousands of dollars i will accept ten thousand for this sum i will find a way to set your son at liberty this is my plan you no doubt have in chicago some friend who can and will oblige you request this friend to insert in three of the city papers here an advertisement as follows if you accept you will say number three we decline which i will read by contraries you will then send by express to be called for a package containing ten thousand dollars in banknotes none larger than one hundred nor smaller than ten and a letter in which you shall bind yourself not to take advantage in any way of my application for this packet at the express office not to set a watch upon me or in any way to entrap me this done i will agree on my part to send you twenty-four hours after receipt of your package a letter telling you in detail where your son is and how to reach him i will not agree to betray his captors i would not be safe anywhere if i did and it is liberty without a master and an easier and safer life that i seek i will also let your son know that he may expect a rescue in proposing this i am running a risk and in accepting it while you will risk your money i if you betray me risk my life if you accept this proposal you will see your son alive and soon if you refuse he is in the hands of desperate men who will never give him up except on their own terms they will wait until driven to despair you will offer them through the press a fortune and even then you may receive after long waiting only a corpse as to the search you are making we know your men and their methods and they are capable of taking a bribe if it is large enough it may interest you to know that they have already held one amicable meeting with our leaders and in the end you are likely to pay them double as to finding your son the men who have him safe and secure will not hesitate to take his life the moment they know that they are likely to lose the game i do not threaten but i do assure you that your best chance of seeing your son alive and in his right mind lies in your sending me the two words we decline with express to e row yours on the square a horrible letter indeed and the awful pictures which poor hilda o'neill's excited imagination drew of the possible situations in some one of which her lover might be suffering lent the last touch of gloom to the wretched whole she saw him in some dingy cellar ill unto death neglected helpless and heartbroken she saw him drugged into insanity a possibility hinted at by the artful writer of the anonymous letter and which i had more than once considered as both possible and probable and she implored miss jenrys to help her and save her lover june my life my very life is in your hands i cannot wait for mr trent eight long hours almost i must act papa left me carte blanche at the bank i was to draw as i needed and i will go at once as soon as this letter is dispatched and see that the money is secured and sent to you and the letter the promise mr trent must make it and he will but the answer june put that in the paper at once so that jerry may soon know that he is to be released you won't refuse i know and june telegraph me the moment it is done etc when i had put the letter down after reading the copied portion twice miss jenrys asked breathlessly what must be done I put into her hand mr. Trent's letter received the previous night and when she had read it she looked troubled He seems to doubt this letter and So do I but why how it sounds plausible too plausible 
I must think this matter over. Mind, I do not say the letter was not written by some dissatisfied member of the band, but don't you see its weak point? He may wish to leave them, and doubtless would like to depart with a full pocket, but he would never dare to release Trent, even if he could. It's simply a trick. They are playing artfully upon the anxiety, the suspense, the wretched state of fear and hope and dread in which young Trent's friends are held to extort from them a little money which will keep them in comfort while they wear out either the father or the son. How? Tell me how? I wish I could. I will tell you how it looks to me. Young Trent has been missing now more than a fortnight. Three weeks almost. You are right. Now, here are three theories. First, he may be dead. He would hardly submit to capture and imprisonment without resistance, and may have died while a prisoner. Next, he may have been so drugged as to have driven him out of his senses. Or he may be a prisoner in some secure retreat, while his captors are trying to break his spirit and force him to write to his friends for a great sum of money by way of ransom. But we must act now and speculate later upon all these possibilities. Do you think Miss O'Neill can have secured the money? I do, yes. Her father's liberality is well known. She could borrow the amount if need be. She comes into her mother's fortune in a few months. Then we must keep a man constantly at the express office on the lookout for E. Rowe. I got up and caught at my hat. Are you going now? Miss Generous, there is not a moment to lose. That money, if sent, must be stopped, if it is possible. And I must see my partner. Thank goodness we have an actual clue at last. At last! A clue? What do you mean? I turned at the door. Don't you see that this is really the first hint we have had to indicate that young Trent is still alive and a prisoner? Up to this moment all has been theory and surmise. If this letter is not a wretched fraud, a bold scheme to obtain money, hatched in the brain of some villain who has seen the advertised rewards, and knows nothing about Trent, it is our first clue, and through it we may find him. And, promising to call upon her again that evening, or sooner if possible, I hastened to the nearest telegraph office. End of chapter 24chapter 25 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson against odds by lawrence l lynch chapter 25 it's a snare my first act upon reaching the telegraph office was to send a message at miss jenrys's request and in her name to hilda o'neill word it as you think best miss jenrys had said and accordingly i had sent this message miss hilda o'neill yours received will do my best for you have courage j j this while indefinite was at least not discouraging to mr trent i wired at some length as follows has money package been sent answer if sent order it held until further notice send at once original letter it may prove a clue letter follows masters this done i wrote at once to mr trent setting forth my belief that the letter was only a scheme to extort money repeating my message with explanatory detail and outlining a plan of action which would await his approval by telegraph and then be put into immediate execution this i posted with a special delivery stamp and finding my head growing large and exceedingly painful i went to my own quarters compelled for a time to give up to the combined pain and fatigue which seemed suddenly to overcome me but in spite of the pain in my head i could not withdraw my thoughts from this singular letter and after tossing restlessly for an hour i got up and having treated my aching skull to a gentle rubbing with my friend the druggist soothing lotion i sallied forth and wandered about the exposition grounds until the time for luncheon and my meeting with dave came together 
Dave was anxious to hear the outcome of my visit to Miss Jenrys, and we made haste with our luncheon and were soon back in our room when I told him the little I had to tell and put into his hand Miss O'Neill's letter, bidding him read the page containing what she declared to be an exact copy of the anonymous letter. Dave read the singular document, as I had done before him, once and again, and then, placing it upon his knee, he sat looking at the floor and biting his under lip. Away he had when puzzled or in doubt. Finally, he looked up. What do you think of this he asked it's a snare don't you think so yes but do you swallow this story of the gang old man supposing young trent to be alive and in duress somewhere do you imagine that one man or even two could keep him day and night um no well i said to miss generous an absurd thing i said the letter might have been suggested by seeing those reward notices but those notices did not give Mr. Trent's full name and street and number. No, sir, that letter was written by someone who has seen the contents of Gerald Trent's pockets and who knows where he is, dead or alive. But you don't think he means business? No, and neither do you. If Trent is in the hands of the gang, no one out of the lot will be permitted to open the doors to him Besides, do you think that a party of men who have the daring and the ability to keep a prisoner three weeks safely hidden will release him for a paltry ten thousand, knowing his father to be a multi-millionaire? Um, just so. And how do they keep him? Well, to me that letter is very suggestive. It hints at a possible situation. It's hard to imagine how a young man, in possession of his strength and senses, could be held a prisoner here in Chicago. But let us say he is ill. Suppose, for instance, he was attacked, those diamonds he is said to have worn being the bait, he is injured. They search him and find him a valuable person to have and to hold. If he is ill, they can keep him without much trouble. Or, the letter hints at insanity. Suppose he was lured somewhere and drugged, kept drugged, an easy way to bring about insanity, eh? Carl! exclaimed Dave, with one of his sudden, decisive gestures. Carl, old man, I believe you struck the trail. What's your next move? My first move, I corrected, will depend upon Mr. Trent. I can do nothing until I hear from him. And then, urged Dave, I can see no better way to begin than to try and break up the gang. Before you find it? he laughed before i look for it good injuns how by making that anonymous letter public putting it in print jimmy netty in spite of the diligence of the watchers they could not regain the lost trail of the little brunette nor indeed of the others and after discussing and discarding many traps and plans dave ventured a suggestion if the brunette has not given up her pursuit of Miss Jenrys, he said, why not try to reach her that way? Ask her to make an appointment. Miss Jenrys will consent. I could think of nothing better, but I did not act upon the suggestion until evening, when I went, this time in company with Lossing, to call upon the ladies and give an account of my day's doings. With the perfection of tact, Lossing joined Miss Ross in the rear room, and left Miss Jenrys and myself to discuss our plans. I told her the little I had done in the Trent affair, and of my plans, contingent upon Mr. Trent's approval. He will approve, I am sure of it, she said with decision. He has taken every precaution, and has made himself familiar with your record through the Boston chief of police. He has every reason, so he writes me, to have faith in you and your judgment. I think you know that. I thanked her for the assurance that my plans would be favourably received, and then told her of my wish to use her name in trying to draw out the brunette. I see no other way, I concluded, and once written her over your initials, she may respond. Of course, the reply must come to you at the office in the government building. But you will receive it. I can give you my card, can I not? Then you do not object? How can I? 
did i not promise you my help oh i am quite enlisted now although after such a faux pas as i made last night i cannot boast of my finesse i quite excited monsieur voisin by my exclamatory entrance and how i asked quietly but inwardly eager you remember how he questioned me about the missing person well he called this afternoon aunt anne and i had just returned from the liberal arts building where we had spent three long hours and though his call was brief he did not forget to ask again about that missing person he was almost inquisitive and you i asked inwardly anxious he learned nothing more from me rest assured his curiosity seems quite unlike him possibly i hazarded he has some inkling of my true inwardness and thinks i have made you my confidant do you think it possible possible perhaps but not the fact she replied with a little laugh my dear aunt has in some way given him the impression that you are a friend or protege of hers i am quite certain that he believes this for he had the audacity to ask me to-day how long my aunt's acquaintance with you had been and when i assured him that you were quite old friends he asked with rather a queer intonation if auntie knew what your occupation was and when i murmured something about journalism he smiled rather knowingly a clear case i said smiling he guesses at least at my business and perhaps fancies me deceiving your dear aunt we will let him continue in that error if possible i went home that evening pondering the question did monsieur voisin know me for what i was and if so how of one thing i was certain since our first meeting he had always affected a most friendly interest in me and that he was secretly studying me i felt quite assured another thing furnished me with some food for thought not long before we took our leave and while miss jenrys and lossing were deep in the discussion of the latest spanish novel miss ross said to me quite abruptly and apropos of nothing did june tell you that monsieur voisin was here to-day i nodded and she went on you know my feeling where he is concerned at least i think you do he is growing really aggressive and june is blind to it she is preoccupied but i see all where she is concerned and he will make her trouble he is infatuated and bitterly jealous and he is a man who knows no law but his own will do i not read him aright the next morning i sent a note written in the same dainty hand as the first and signed with the initials j j to the little brunette sending it as before to the cafe where she had lodged and twenty-four hours later the telegram from boston came in addition to my own letter i had sent in the same envelope a copy of miss o'neill's or as much of it as would help mr trent to understand all that had been done by the young ladies in his absence his telegram read thanks for all carry out plan have ordered return of money letter follows trent two days later came mr trent's letter and with it the original composition of mr e Rowe on the square as miss o'neill had said it was written in a small clear angular hand which had the look of a genuine autograph without attempt at disguise in this i quite agreed with her and i stowed the letter carefully away for future use mr trent in his letter assured me that he could not make e rose letter ring true and that he had finally convinced his daughter and miss o'neill that they had made a mistake go on in your own way he concluded and i hope before long to be with you my wife has recovered from her delirium very weak but quite sane except upon one point she believes our son to be ill in a hospital in chicago and the doctor has bidden us humor her in this hallucination as it may save her life he looks now for a gradual recovery and when she is a little stronger i shall come to you already she has planned for the journey and assured me that our boy needs me most it is sad inexpressibly so but it is better at least for her when i can join you in your work and your waiting i shall i am sure feel more helpful and i trust less impatient of delay
End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter twenty six a columbian guard it was still our theory dave's and mine that granted our original quarry was still in the white city we must sooner or later encounter it if we continued to traverse the thickly populated enclosure long enough and with an eye single to our search we believed as firmly yes more firmly than at first that delbras and his band were still much of the time in midway and after long watching we had grown to believe that they had somewhere upon stony island avenue a retreat where all could find shelter and safety in time of need but one thing's certain quoth dave when we were discussing the matter wherever the place is they can approach it from more directions and more entrances than one they some of them have been seen to enter saloons to go upstairs around corners and into basements and are never seen to come out i can only account for it in one way and what is that i questioned they enter always at the side or rear and never at the front and they only do this when they know by signal that the way is clear if that is true i said we shall find them sooner or later one of the characters assumed by me when going about the grounds in my capacity of a detective was that of a columbian guard i had a natty blue uniform in which when donned with the addition of a brown curly wig and a luxuriant moustache just light enough to be called blonde I became a really distinguished guard and more than once when thus attired I have watched the conscious faces and overburdened shoulders and heads of the multitude of uniformed martyrs who on these oft recurring dedication days state and national not to mention receptions to the great native and foreign tramped in sun mud or rain arrayed in all the rainbow hues beplumed gilded and uncomfortable and have thanked the good sense and good taste that evolved for the manly good-looking c g a uniform at once tasteful soldierly and subdued in which one might walk abroad and not feel shamefacedly aware that he was too brilliantly picturesque for comfort in this array i have more than once passed my acquaintances of the bureau and the hospital miss jenrys and her aunt and even lossing until one day it occurred to me that i might keep him near me enjoy his society and still be on duty by making myself known and so until he chose to go on duty for a part of the day we went up and down midway and in and out of the foreign villages together as dave described us keeping step with our chin straps up we had made our first acquaintance in the pleasance as a brace of guards off duty on the day upon which I posted the decoy letter to the little brunette I Have made this letter as brief as possible Merely asking her to name a day or evening when she would be at liberty to do the liberal arts etc In company with the writer and upon second thought I saw that it would be a great mistake for me to call for the reply in case the brunette caught at the bait she had shown herself a wary opponent and she might think it worth while to know who received her answer it was late in the day when we left midway and with this new thought in my mind i dropped lossing's arm as we approached the java village and skirting the west side of the enclosure left the grounds by the midway exit at madison avenue and hastened on to washington avenue as i turned a corner i saw a smart carriage at miss jenrys's door but before I had reached the house I saw the driver turn his head and gather up his reins and the next moment monsieur voisin attired as if for a visit of ceremony came down the steps slowly almost reluctantly it seemed to me entered the carriage and dashed past me without a glance to right or left a card brought miss jenrys to the little reception room where I waited and when she had inspected my disguise which she declared quite perfect I made known my errand 
and as i fully expected she declared my second thought best i will go to-morrow there will hardly be an answer before that time and suppose we should meet before i could reply the door opened and miss ross came in a disguised detective is a thing to see she declared and then when she had looked me over and marvelled at the fit of my wig she turned to her niece june child did thee speak of our dilemma auntie you must give me time her face flushing rosily time indeed did not this young man's card say a moment in haste and can we entertain this strange young man by the hour fie upon thee june do thy duty else june's hand went out in a pretty gesture and between the two they made the dilemma clear to me some time since when miss jenrys had expressed a wish to see the plaisance thoroughly i had offered my services promising to take them safely through the strange places behind the mysterious gates and doors where they had not ventured to penetrate alone now they had an especial reason for wishing to make this excursion on the next day and would i be at liberty i assured them that in any case i should doubtless pass a part of the day at least in midway and if they would allow me to include lossing in our party there need be no change save that instead of wearing our guards uniform we would go as citizen sightseers and instead of a party of two there would be a quartet and so it was arranged before leaving the house i had been told what i had surmised before entering monsieur voisin had asked miss jenrys to drive with him and when she had declined upon a plea of indisposition he had renewed the invitation for the following day whereupon miss jenrys in sheer desperation recalled that proposed visit to midway and falling back upon that once more declined with thanks certainly monsieur voisin was a persistent wooer he was much in my thoughts after i had left the ladies and quite naturally followed me into dreamland my head was heavy with pain and i went to my room at an early hour it was long before the lotion did its work and i fell asleep and then i dreamed that monsieur voisin had carried off june jenrys and had shut her into an old building in care of the brunette who locked her in a room at the top of the house and then set it on fire below i saw the flames shoot forth i saw june's face pallid and desperate at the window beyond the reach of the highest ladder i saw lossing dash through the flames and with a yell i awoke End of chapter twenty six Chapter twenty seven of Against Dots by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter twenty seven. I'd swear to them hands anywhere. At one o'clock, Lossing and I met the ladies at the rendezvous, as we had grown to call the Nebraska House parlour, and the little arbour beside the stream. Lossing, quite himself again was handsome in his well-fitting light summer suit and happy in the prospect of an afternoon with beautiful june jenrys as who would not be and i was humbly thankful that i was not for that afternoon at least obliged to wear a skin-tight wig upon my sore and tender cranium that they might reserve their strength for the ins and outs of midway we brought to the gate for the use of the ladies the two stalwart chair pushers whose work, so far as they had been concerned, had been a sinecure indeed since the attack upon Lossing, and we went at once, and without stops by the way, to the post office. But there was no letter for Miss Jenrys, and although I looked about me with a practised eye, followed Miss Jenrys at a safe distance when she entered the office, and kept the others waiting while I took a last long look, I could see no signs of the brunette. Midway Pleasance was almost unknown ground to Miss Ross, and her wonder, amusement, and quaint comments made her an interesting companion. "'We must see it all, Auntie,' June Jenrys declared, her fair face glowing with the sweet content 
with her companion and the moment and not even the sorrows of her distant friends which had weighed so heavily upon her own kind heart could for the time overshadow or abate i shall be guided by my escort was the reply of my companion and i do feel that we may forget our anxieties for a time and take in all this strangeness and charm with our whole hearts we did not linger long in the hall of beauty the costumes of many nations being passed by with scarce a glance but my companions lingered longest before the queer little person described in the catalogue as the display of china who was a genuine child of the flowery kingdom and generally fast asleep we turned away from the very wet man in the submarine diving exhibit with a mutual shiver and rejoiced anew in the sunlight and free air the glassworks interesting as they assuredly were we passed by as being not sufficiently foreign and the irish industrial village and blarney castle were voted among the things to be taken seriously and not in the spirit of midway miss ross was full of interest in the little javanese and we entered their enclosure feeling sure that here at least was something novel we had peered into the primitive little houses upon their stilt-like posts and the ladies had spent some time in watching a quaint little native mother making efforts to at once ply the queer sticks which helped her in a strange sort of mat weaving and keep an eye upon a preternaturally solemn-faced infant who despite his gravity seemed capable of quite as much mischief as the average enfant terrible of civilization and then let's go and see the orangutan exclaimed someone behind us and as they went a sun browned rustic and his sweetheart we silently followed the orang was of a retiring disposition and very little of him was visible from our point of vantage as i shifted my position in order to give the ladies a better place a familiar voice close beside me cried with evident pleasure well lord a massy if it ain't you come to see the big monkey like all the rest of us ain't much of a sight yet it was mrs camp and she seemed quite alone she put out her hand with perfect faith in my pleasure at the meeting and when i took it and spoke her name i felt a soft touch at my elbow i had told the ladies of my acquaintance with mrs camp and they had fully enjoyed the woman's sharp sallies at my expense i quite understood the meaning of miss generous's hint but while i hesitated mrs camp began again i've left camp to home this time i've tramped and traipsed with him up and down this here midway but i've never once got him inside none of these places since he took me to that blue place over there that they call the persian palace no more a palace than our new smoke-house but adam's seen so much foreign dancing as she talked she ran her eyes from one of our group to another and as she uttered the words foreign dancing her eyes fell full upon miss ross who at once said turning to me perhaps they would better introduce thy friend it was done and in a moment mrs camp was standing close beside miss jenrys making note of her beauty and taking in the points of her toilet with appreciative eyes while her tongue wagged on vigorously she had taken up her story of her husband's quitting of midway he hadn't never no notion of dancing she declared and never took a step in his life not to music that is but he wanted to learn all he could about furrin ways he said so in we went well you ought to a seen them girls maybe you have though no murmured june well then you don't want to dancing i've got an old hen almost ten years old i've been a-keeping her to see how long a hen would live and if that hen can't take more the honest dancing steps than a whole pussy o them hurries as they call em all the dancing they know they'd a learnt from snakes and eels and such like wriggling things pshaw i don't believe that old monkey's going to show himself to-day humbly thing when we turned away from the java village mrs camp was one of our party and when we entered hagenbeck's animal show she was still telling miss ross and i how she and adam had not agreed upon a route that day and how she had revolted utterly when he proposed to spend the afternoon down to the odds and ends corner of the fair among the skeletons and old bones 
and ruins and mummies, and how for once they each took their own way. It was Miss Ross who had kindly asked the lone woman, as she described herself, to join our party, and she bore with sweet patience and an indulgent half-smile her many remarks, absurd or outre, shrewd or unsophisticated. I'm sick of that feller, she exclaimed, as the hot, hot, hot of the Turkish vendor of warm cakes was heard. The very idea of a yellow-faced feller like that taken to cooking hot waffles for a living, right on the street, too. I should think he could get enough cloth out of them baggy trousers to make a little tent. If I was the boss here, I'd make him do his cooking quieter. He just spoils the street. In the German village, our party rested, and the ladies enjoyed its quaint and picturesque cottages and castle, and listened with pleasure to the German band, all but Mrs. Camp. I don't see nothing very striking here, she candidly observed, and I don't see the need of putting so many queer-looking barns. The house is well enough, but I'll bet them windows come out of Noah's Ark, and I can't make so much beer drinking look just right for women. As we passed out, she was so rash as to pause a moment to look down into a huge vessel, full to the brim of the queer-looking compound which the vendor described in a loud voice as bum-bum candy. Lady, lady, he cried as she turned away. Fine bum bum, splendid. But the look she cast over her shoulder silenced his eloquence. That fella, she declared, has been setting around here in one place or another ever since I've been here with his bum bum candy. I've never got close enough to get a look at the stuff till today, and I've never saw a soul buying it nor eating it. It had been agreed that we should take a trip. In the ferris wheel with the ladies it would be a novel experience but when we were about to enter the car mrs camp drew back tain't no use she said i ain't going to risk my neck that way it's just a flying in the face of providence i couldn't get adam to as much as look at the thing when twas going round no sir i ain't a-going this to the man at the still open door but when we had taken our places and the door was about to close she sprang forward hold on she said i guess i've a good a right to tempt providence as anybody don't shut that door i want to get in as she sat down beside me she said with the air of one who has done a good deed i hadn't ought to a let you get a ticket for me but i didn't feel so squeamy till i got right here seems safe enough though don't it miss ross assured her of its safety and i told her how thoroughly it had been tested but suddenly she broke in upon my speech Shh! Why, we're a going. My, how easy! She seemed for a moment to hold her breath, and then I saw her hands clutch at the revolving seat. Land sakes, it's a tippin! Mercy on me! I can't stand this! Say, to the man in charge who was about to begin his story of the wheel, I want to get out. I can't never go higher. Just turn back. Please do! To my surprise, he arose and moved toward the door. Then, with his hand upon it, he turned. It might make you a little dizzy when we reverse the engine, ma'am. Just close your eyes tight till we stop, and you'll feel all right, and not so likely to faint when you begin to walk. With a sigh of relief and a shudder of terror, she put her cotton-gloved hands over her eyes, and sat crouched over in a very wilted attitude. And I was on the point of speaking rather sharply to the man, when a look in his eye, and rapid gesture somehow restored my confidence in his ability to manage the car, and we went on smoothly and silently up. We had reached the topmost curve before Mrs. Camp moved a finger, and then Miss Jenrys, gazing out over the wonderful landscape outspread so far below, uttered a quick exclamation of delight. Then the hands fell. She started up and looked quickly around and for a moment stood with mouth agape and hands thrown out as if for support or balance. Suddenly she drew a long, relieved breath and dropped back into her seat. Mrs. Camp was herself again. My! she aspirated, and after another long look all about her, Young man, I declare if I ain't obliged to you just as much as if you'd a-minded me. She ventured near the window and even put her head out. My! 
they look just like flies a-walking my we can't look much to the angels looking down they go awful jerky she said no more until we were almost at the bottom then she turned to miss ross i've a good mind to go round again she declared and when she was told that we were all going round again she drew close to the window and made her second circuit in breathless silence as we left the wheel and came out from the gate where a crowd was pushing and pressing for entrance miss jenrys feeling herself suddenly jostled by some impatient one uttered a quick exclamation and at the sound someone just before me and whom i had not chanced to observe in the crowd turned quickly shot a hasty glance at miss jenrys and as suddenly turned back again the face was that of a youth dark-skinned and with keen black eyes the hair cropped close to the head was as black as the thick long lashes the form was slender and the head scarcely came up to my shoulders a slight figure a youthful face it caught and riveted my attention after the first glance in our direction the young man seemed only anxious to extricate him from the crowd which he soon did we were on our way to cairo street and when we entered at the nearest gateway i saw this same youth just ahead lossing and miss jenrys went before and as they turned into the street proper and moved slowly toward the east court where the donkey boys were gathered the youth who had paused as if in indecision glanced up and down the street and then hurried away toward the temple of luxor at the western end of the enclosure there was much of interest in the street but the ladies soon tired of watching the donkey boys and smiling at the awkward feats of the camel riders and turned their attention toward the shops and the architecture turning finally from mosque and theater to the more private apartments they were hardly houses with their small high balconies their latticed windows their dark doorways their sills almost level with the street it was miss ross who expressed the desire to have a nearer view of one of these dark and cool looking interiors and as we turned our faces westward i saw across the way on the inner side of the street an open doorway giving just a glimpse of some dark hangings a brass lantern swinging from the roof and a couple of men in flowing robes and turbans lounging upon a divan within beckoning to the others i crossed the street spoke to the men and finding that one could understand a little english asked permission to enter with the ladies it was granted after a moment's hesitation and a quick glance at his companion who did not rise from the divan and who answered the look with a grunt which doubtless meant consent there were no seats in the place save the rug-covered divan which filled one side from corner to corner the floor was covered with rugs and the walls were hung with the same except where a little at one side in the rear wall was a narrow door painted almost black and having a ponderous and strange-looking latch the wall draperies to me looked simply a well-blended pattern in dull blue and other soft tints and just as one might see in the shops anywhere but the ladies were of a different opinion and they at once began a close and exclamatory inspection of each extolling their colour their texture their quaint design the rarity and costliness they had viewed the rugs upon the rear walls lossing seemed not far behind them in the matter of admiration and had passed to the side wall opposite the divan and quite out of sight from the street there being no windows on that side in fact no one side of the rug hung room which was lighted solely by the door that standing wide open served as a further screen for those behind it mrs camp having faithfully tried to admire the rugs for courtesy's sake had failed utterly and to the evident surprise of the silent egyptian who still sat in his place had coolly seated herself upon the end of the divan nearest the street our host meantime standing near the middle of the room alert and evidently somewhat curious after a brief glance at the second row of rugs i had crossed the small room and seated myself near mrs camp and a moment later a big determined-looking woman american or english if one might judge from her face and dress the latter being full mourning and in the height of fashion entered 
she neither spoke nor looked about her but went with the tread of a tragedy queen toward the narrow dark door in the rear wall in an instant before the startled kyrene could prevent her she had her hand upon the door and had jerked it half open but before she could enter the tall oriental had reached her side and somehow instantly the door was closed and the woman staring at it and him as he stood before her he bent toward her and uttered some word respectful it seemed but decisive and she with a baffled and angry look turned slowly and went out but she took my benediction with her as i sat near mrs camp i was in a direct angle with that little door which opened against the inner wall and in the moment while that door stood open i saw not as i thought might be the case the outer world with the usual debris of a back door but an inner room and in that room his face toward me as he reclined his head lifted startled perhaps from an afternoon nap i saw a man a man whom i knew i could hardly sit there and wait for my friends to sufficiently admire the remaining rugs i wanted to get out and if possible to see cairo street from the rear for i now remembered that on each side of midway between the houses and villages and the enclosing palings was a driveway twenty feet in width for the convenience of the inhabitants who received their marketing at night and from this rear avenue but my star was in the ascendant at the moment when i could hardly repress my anxiety and impatience a man entered slowly at first then starting slightly he threw one hasty glance around him and strode quickly toward the narrow door which the kyrene opened for and closed after him my land it was mrs camp who had uttered the ejaculation under her breath with her eye upon the man by the door say she went on meeting my eye do you know who that was do you i counter questioned well maybe i mistook but he looks the very moral of the furren feller at changed that money for camp and gave him counterfeits she half rose i'm going to ask she explained stop i caught her hand you must not leave it to me i'll find out i was too full of my own thoughts to enjoy cairo after that and was glad when we set out to visit the temple of luxor i wanted to get away and to see dave brainerd it was half an hour after our experience in the place of rugs and we were nearing the temple when we were forced to stand by the approach of the wedding procession with its camels and brazen gongs its dancers fighters musicians etc as we stood pressed close against the wall some one came swiftly across the narrow way dodging between two camels and greeted us with effusion it was monsieur voisin and when the parade had passed and we moved on he placed himself beside miss ross who at once presented him to mrs camp in accordance with her notion of strict etiquette that good woman put out her hand to him in greeting and when the formality was over the way being too narrow and the crowd dense i fell behind with her at my side miss ross having been taken possession of by the cool frenchman for some paces mrs camp contrary to her custom was quite silent then as we approached the temple the others having already entered she stopped and caught me by the arm say she said in a tone of mystery i must have been mistaken before about that feller in that house a being the counterfeit money man why i demanded because do you remember my telling you about that feller having such long slim hands i nodded well this feller ahead there with miss ross he's the one i'd swear to them hands anywhere i stopped just long enough to speak a few words of caution and we followed the others late that night i said to dave brainerd dave i have seen the brunette greenback bob and delbra end of chapter 27Chapter twenty eight of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson.
Chapter Twenty Eight. Now down. Miss Jenrys went faithfully to the post office in the government building the day after our visit to Midway, and the next, and the next. On the fourth day she was rewarded, and when I appeared at her door, as I did every day now, by appointment, and at a fixed hour, she put a square envelope into my hand. It was addressed to J.J., World's Fair P.O., and the seal was unbroken. I looked at the initials in surprise. Is it possible, I asked, that you two have not exchanged names? Has it always been J.J. and H.A.? Quite so, she laughed. It was her proposal. It would keep up the romance of the acquaintance, she said, and as I held out the envelope toward her. No, that is your letter. I have no interest in it, and little curiosity concerning it. Then, said I, as I broke the seal, I shall read it to you because of that little. And when I had unfolded the sheet, I sat so long staring at it that she asked lightly, does it contain a scent after all? I put the letter in her hand. Read for yourself, I said, trying to speak carelessly, and she read aloud. My kind friend, I much regret that because of Mamma's illness, I cannot leave her for the present. But at the first moment of leisure, I shall let you know that I am at your service. How much I regret the loss of your charming company, and long for a sight of your charming face, is only known to yours, H. A. Bah! She tossed the letter back to me with a little disdainful laugh. It reads like a love letter, and is anything but filial. As I folded the letter and put it carefully away, she watched me keenly. Mr. Masters, she said, you have been in some unaccountable manner startled or shocked by that letter. I could neither deny nor explain, and I frankly admitted it, assuring her that she would not remain long in the dark. Oh, I can wait, she smiled. Do not fancy me so unreasonable as to expect the full confidence of a detective. Only don't fear for my nerves, and let me help in any way that I can. I think, laughing, that I have said this before. I was anxious to go now, and rising, I took her at her word. You can help me in two ways, I said, but I must ask you not to demand reasons just yet. Go on, she said promptly. First, should this brunette, this H.A., write you again, you will inform me at once, and I don't think it likely to occur, but if she should call here, will you refuse to receive her? Yes, to both, but she does not know my address. You forget, she has been seen to pass this house. Don't be too sure. I will be on my guard. Is that all? There is another point, a delicate one. I could not but see that Monsieur Voisin's company that day in Midway was not entirely welcome to your aunt and yourself and bear with me please i am speaking in the interest of another promise me that you will not close your doors against monsieur voisin or treat him too coldly for a little while believe me my reason is one that you will be first to endorse when it is known to you she hesitated and i hurried on the man is of a fiery disposition and he recognizes a rival in the field pardon my intrusion upon delicate ground he comes from the land of duelists. She started. A little patience and diplomacy upon your part, and I think I can promise that he will not annoy you much longer. Very well, she assented. I agree. Auntie, strange to say, has urged the same thing, concerning Monsieur Voisin, that is. At the worst, we can go home. It is now the last of June, and we go in any case in July. Never fear. I shall not forget your admonitions, any of them. And she gave me her hand at the door with a reassuring smile. Halfway over the threshold, I turned back to say, By the way, Miss Jenrys, if I chance to appear here at the same time as Monsieur Voisin, please be kind to me. Late that same night, Dave Brainerd and I held one of our long and in the past oft times useless and mistaken symposiums. But this time we were in perfect accord. 
we had spread upon the table before us our old memoranda from the very beginning of our campaign and also some few letters and other documents it had been a long session according to dave but the conclusion was so satisfactory that at the last we had each lighted a cigar and celebrated thus what we considered a fully mapped out campaign at last well pronounced dave with a sigh of content as he tipped back his chair and elevated his feet to the top of the table between us this looks like business let us see first checking off on his fingers we're to keep away from midway all but billy so that they may not make another flitting eh yes i assented and we're to patrol stony island avenue and the surrounding country by day and by night with a full force ain't that it perfectly dave you are as full of repetitions as an old woman or a young one he retorted and you think it is proved that the brunette's a man do you it was proved for me long ago and that letter i can't see why it should not be launched at once i had written to mr trent telling him of certain facts and theories and among them was the suggestion that we should cause a copy of the row letter with its proposed barter to be published in the morning papers giving him my reasons at length and requesting his opinion before taking what might prove a very decisive if not aggressive step dave was delighted with this idea and wearied with our masterly inactivity he would as he put it launch the thing at once my reasons as explained to both dave and mr trent were the letter signed row and offering to liberate young trent and at the same time to defraud the comrades of the clique if genuine would when published expose the writer who would then be obliged to leave the clique as he had expressed it and with an additional reason for doing so this would at least lessen their numbers and perhaps force them to take into their confidence some new colleague or perhaps it would result in a quarrel among themselves which also might result in some way in our favour on the other hand if it were a scheme of the clique it would seem that at least they were tired of the game and in need of money and the advertised letter if followed up by another advertisement in which a correspondence might be proposed or some proffer made might draw them out and in some way this must be done in the meantime a warrant must be issued or rather two one descriptive of the brunette as a woman the other as a man and since the lausch people had not done so we would if we could arrest her or him on the charge of robbery i had to go over the ground once more to quiet dave or to tire him out and we ended at last as usual in mutual agreement several days must pass i knew before mr trent would arrive i had written him daily and he had replied by telegraph he would be with me soon and would wire me the date of his arrival in the meanwhile i was to act upon my best judgment in the matter of delaying the advertisement i decided to wait and watch and so a few more days passed in routine and quiet on one of these quiet days lossing and i in a moment of leisure went down to that interesting and by many neglected portion of the exposition grounds where are situated the cliff dwellers the krupp gun giant of its kind the department of ethnology and the great stock pavilion where the english military tournaments were held afternoons and evenings it seemed to be by mutual consent that we turned away from the little point of land where la rabida sat isolated as a convent should and crossing the bridge that spanned the inlet between the convent and the stately agricultural building we passed through its spacious central promenade and passing by the obelisk and under the colonnade paused at the military encampment there was no performance at that hour but men and horses were being led into the monster pavilion for exercise a big trooper explained to us and a bit of drill for the horses at which lossing slipped his hand through my arm come on he said and a little to my surprise he led me to a side door and taking a card from his pocket 
held it an instant before the eyes of the soldier on guard saying a word as he passed him which i did not catch as we entered the great enclosure a group of officers were standing near the centre of the arena in busy converse and a heavy artillery team was being put through its paces while nearer our place of observation several cavalrymen were leading their horses up and down the officers evidently were discussing and arranging some matter of importance but while i noted this i also noted that one of them who stood facing toward us lifted his hand in salute and then moved it toward us in a less formal gesture and again to my surprise my companion lifted his hand and returned the salute in kind before he could look at me i had turned my eyes away and was watching with evident interest the manoeuvres of the cavalrymen they had mounted their animals and were beginning to put them through their paces and presently they began the drill known as throwing their horses galloping the animals to a certain point they were brought to a short and sudden stand and then by a quick tug upon the bit the animal if well trained allowed itself to fall upon one side the rider instantly slipping from the saddle to a position half concealed by the body of the horse from an imaginary enemy in front and gun in hand ready to take aim across the saddle there was one man who did not at first go through this evolution with the others but set his horse near the rest looking on when the others had gone through the exercise this man rode forward put his horse at a gallop stopped him splendidly and attempted the fall but the animal was obstinate or only half broken and began to show signs of both fright and fight as his rider turned the excited creature about and sent him at a mad gallop across the arena one of the troopers came at an easy trot directly toward us and drawing rein beside us with a lift of his hat said respectfully good morning sir i hope you are well sir good morning george replied lossing easily what is the matter with that horse he's a new one sir and not quite broke though i do think sir as he hasn't the best and kindest of riders sir and that makes him worse yes said lossing absently with his eyes following the horse which was a really fine animal one to attract a horse lover it's too bad went on the trooper diggs will have to ride him this afternoon and it'll bait the captain awful for one of our horses come a fluke last evening i'd be sorry for diggs i'm sorry for the horse george go and ask the captain to send diggs and his horse to me no doubt my face showed my surprise as the trooper rode obediently off to do his bidding but lossing only smiled and moved a step or two away from the rail where we had been standing diggs he said as the man rode up and saluted will you let me try your horse the soldier saluted again and dismounted without a word and lossing took the bridle from his hand and for a few moments stood beside the horse stroking him smoothing his mane and all the time speaking some low soothing syllables that seemed to quiet the still quivering animal after a little of this he examined the saddle adjusted the stirrups and bridle and then after leading the horse away from us a short distance he stepped easily and quietly into the saddle instantly the creature's head was erected and his ears put back but lossing with a caressing hand upon his neck continued his low soothing syllables and let the animal walk the length of the long enclosure turning then he sent him back at a gentle trot which he increased gradually until he was careering around the arena in circles which became shorter and shorter until he came to a halt in the centre of the vast place then after a few more gentle words and light pats on the sleek neck he bent over and suddenly drew the rein once twice three times he gave that sharp pull but the horse stood steadfast turning in his saddle he said something to the troopers who had drawn near him and then sat erect in his place while three of the troopers turned their horses and went careering around the motionless horse and rider soon at another word from lossing one of the men rode alongside while the others drew back 
when the trooper had ranged himself at the side of lossing's horse and only a few feet away lossing nodded and at the first tug at the rein the trooper's well-trained animal went down and lay supine and moveless then lossing beckoned a second time and as the fallen horse got up he was caressed by lossing who leaned from his saddle to reach him and then led away as the second trooper came up leading his horse as the animals stood side by side lossing dismounted stood a moment beside his refractory steed and then with a gentle pat and a low word as if of reproof he turned and patting the other animal a moment sprang to its back and sent it galloping around the place then bringing him back to place and with a pat or two and a quick now down threw him sprang to his feet and before the animal could rise had again mounted the wayward horse once more he trotted slowly away caressing and talking to the horse and then suddenly wheeling him he gave a cheery command and sent the creature flying back past his old place and across the pavilion then turning and halting the horse before the group of officers he gave him a brisk pat and said cheerily now down and almost with the word the creature threw up its head and with scarcely an instant's hesitation went over and lay quivering upon the ground a cheer went up from the onlookers but without loss of time lossing had the horse up turned him about and seeing him quite fit and not too nervous remounted and now the horse was obedient to his every move or word twice more he threw him and then Returning him to Diggs, he said, Diggs, a horse can be as jealous as a woman, and more easily shamed than a boy, and if you are skilful and love your horse, you can master him, but beware of the first angry word. Anger makes brutes. It never made an intelligent animal yet. He took my arm, and with a bow and a shake of the head to the officers who were moving toward him, and a nod to the troopers, he hurried me out of the pavilion. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Lynn Thompson。Chapter 29 Fire! 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 June had passed and July had come. Mr. Trent had arrived and was eating his heart out while the days dragged by. Miss Jenrys waited and wondered and wrote to Miss O'Neill letters which she tried to make cheerful until one day she received a telegram. Mrs. Trent no longer needed her and Hilda O'Neill was coming to Chicago. She would set out on July the 3rd. Of course, I was summoned to meet her when she came and I learned then something about ordeal by question. She was a pretty, brown-eyed, gypsy-like and petite maiden, more child than woman in her ways, but with a warm, loving and faithful heart, and a wit as bright and ready almost as that of June Jenris, who was, to my mind, the cleverest as well as the queenliest of girls. Miss O'Neill's presence was a boon to the sad-hearted father, for she would not despair and nature having blessed her with a strong and hopeful temperament and an abounding faith in a final good she kept the father's heart from despairing utterly miss jenris true to her word had continued to receive monsieur voisin though she used much diplomacy in the matter and seldom if ever received him alone lossing and i often met him there and as the days wore on i noted that lossing was growing melancholy or at least more serious and thoughtful than of old and I attributed a part of this to Voisin's ever courteous and too frequent presence in Washington Avenue. I was much with him in these days. Every day, almost, would find us together for a longer or less length of time, according to my occupation or lack of it. One day, after a long and learned discussion of the watercrafts of all countries, we, Lossing and myself, turned our steps toward the transportation building to see a certain African brimba sent all the way from Banguella, Africa, and to my eyes a most unseaworthy craft. 
It was shortly after the noon hour, and Lossing and I had been lunching with June Jenrys and her friend by invitation, in consequence of which I was not disguised, while Lossing, by command of Miss Jenrys, had worn, and still wore, his guard's uniform. As we were passing from the main building to the annex, I saw Lossing start, and, looking up, beheld Monsieur Voisin standing alone in the aisle, and evidently awaiting our approach. He was, as usual, smiling and affable, and overjoyed to meet with congenial spirits. He fell into step with us at once, and so we were proceeding in the direction of the mammoth locomotive display, when suddenly the alarm of fire rang out all about us, and the cry, Fire! 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 seemed sounding everywhere in an instant. Following in the wake of a hundred others, we hastened out. We were not far from the scene of that awful conflagration, and we rushed forward, as men do at such times, carried out of themselves often, and reckless of danger. Who can paint the story of that awful fire? What need to tell it? It has passed out of history, and its victims to their rest and recompense. The mourning caused by that hateful death-trap the cold storage building is known to all the world the recklessness the heroism the strict obedience to orders in the face of death the horror the suffering the loss of gallant lives all these are known and yet there remains much that has never been told and never will be tales of reckless daring of risks taken for humanity's sake of kindly humane deeds unchronicled and of cowardice selfishness dishonourable acts that were better left unwritten among those who stood ready to aid and who showed in that dreadful time neither fear nor undue excitement was lossing where help was needed his hands were ready and it was not long so ill-fitted was the tindery edifice to resist the flames before the worst had happened the tower had fallen and the dead and dying rather than the burning structure became the chief almost the sole care of the earnest workers firemen and others with the falling of the tower one end of the building from top to base became enveloped in flames and smoke and flying timbers borne that way by the wind made the place especially dangerous as the blackened fragments fell small wonder that seen through the smoke and fire they were sometimes mistaken for human beings by those who had seen brave men making that fearful leap. It was impossible to keep together in such a place, and we did not attempt it. But as I now and then cast an anxious glance toward Lossing, I noted that Voisin seemed to be all the time near him. It was some moments after the falling of the tower, and while it was still believed that there were yet men upon the burning roof, that I moved toward the end of the building, where the smoke was hanging like a curtain over everything below, while lifting somewhat above, to look, if possible, toward that part of the roof which might be yet intact. Lossing and Voisin seemed to be eagerly watching something perilously near the choking smoke and falling timbers, I thought, and I shouted a warning to them, just as a group of firemen crossed my path almost at the instant a voice it sounded like voisin's cried look there's a man in the hubbub of sounds the cry was not heard beyond me i could not have heard it a few feet further away but as it struck my ears i saw lossing look up and following his gaze with my own i saw something black and bulky something that looked like an arm thrust out as it fell down and outward and into the thick smoke that obscured that end of the building altogether was it a man falling there in the thick of that suffocating smoke i saw lossing spring forward and dash into the midst of it with voisin close behind and then with a shudder i rushed after them seeing nothing but entering where they had entered the smoke cloud and then for an instant i paused and held my breath the thing that had fallen lay in the thickest of the smoke and over it Lossing was just about to bend when I halted, seeing a sudden movement on Voisin's part which made me clench my hands. For the moment, save for my unseen self, they were alone, shut in by the shifting but never rising smoke, and in that moment, as Lossing bent over to peer at the thing on the ground at his feet, 
the man just behind him drew from his pocket something which i guessed at rather than recognized something which caused me to spring forward with my fist clenched it was the work of a moment to strike down the man who in an instant with a criminal's basest weapon would have stunned lossing and left him there in the choking smoke to be suffocated as Voisin went down i had just enough strength and breath to catch hold of lossing and drag him out and in a moment calling some others to my aid we went in after Voisin. as we lifted him the knuckles dropped from his relaxed hand and unnoticed in the smoke i picked them up and hastily concealed them he was quite insensible and a little stream of blood was trickling from one side of his face where he had struck upon some hard substance in falling as he lay upon the ground a sudden thought caused me to start and i bent down quickly put my finger solicitously upon his wrist and then pushing back the dark hair which always lay in a curving mass over his brow a little to one side i laid bare a rather high forehead upon which clearly defined was an oblong scar quite close to the roots of the concealing love lock calling lossing's attention to this i replaced the lock smoothed it into place and arose come away i said to lossing and leaving voisin in the hands of those about him for a moment we withdrew to a place where we might see and be unseen i told lossing of the attempt upon his life and he was not greatly surprised i ought to have been on my guard he said for i think he caused me that lagoon dip but i was carried out of myself by this cursed holocaust what shall we do keep out of his sight and let them take him to the hospital he's not seriously hurt possibly he's shamming now though he was stunned as well as half suffocated it was as i surmised voisin opened his eyes after some time and made an effort to rise but he seemed weak and dazed and they withdrew him from the place where he lay and made him comfortable in a sheltered spot to await the return of an ambulance going back for a few moments to note the progress of the fire they were not long absent but when they went back to their charge he was not there and a bystander had seen him rise look about him and move away at first slowly and then quite briskly in the direction of the sixty-fourth street entrance i had persuaded lossing to remain out of sight and had myself viewed voisin's departure from afar and when i reported the fact lossing exclaimed masters this must end that man must not be permitted to visit miss jenris after this rest easy i answered him the villain will at once take measures to learn the truth about you and when he knows that you are not lying somewhere on a cold slab awaiting recognition he will know that his matrimonial game is up i took a sidewise glance at lossing as i spoke the next words and that one fortune at least has slipped through his fingers his eyes sombre and proud at once turned slowly toward me as i spoke masters he said i wish to heaven june jenris were as poor as poor as i am to this i had no answer ready and we walked on for a short time in silence then suddenly he stopped short masters he said what was it that fell when i went into the smoke like an idiot a piece of timber with a burning rag fluttering from it a coat thrown off by one of those poor fellows just the bait was unwanted i replied End of chapter 29Chapter Thirty of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Thirty. It shall not be all suspense. Since the coming of Mister Trent, who had secured rooms next door to the house occupied by Miss Ross and her niece, it had become my habit to pass an hour, more or less in miss jenrys's parlours each day in the afternoon or evening as was most convenient and often besides mr trent and of late miss o'neil lossing made one of the party 
for he had come to know as much almost as any one of us concerning gerald trent's strange absence on leaving the scene of the fire it was important that i should have a few words with dave brainerd and this done i was as ready to set out for miss jenrys's cosy apartment as was lossing for i felt with him that monsieur voisin must no longer be permitted to annoy the ladies even for the good of the cause in which i was so deeply interested imagine my surprise then when i learned privately and from the lips of miss ross that monsieur voisin had been there in advance of us and had gone seated in the little rear parlour with the portiere drawn the clear-headed little quakeress told me the story of his visit i had observed upon entering that june jenrys was not quite her usual tranquil self-possessed self that her cheeks wore an unwanted flush and that her eyes were very bright and restless while there seemed just a shade of nervousness and a certain repressed energy in her manner miss ross had led me with little ceremony into the rear room and she lost no time once we were seated i don't know what thee may have on thy mind this evening she began but whatever it is i will not detain thee long monsieur voisin has been here he left indeed less than an hour ago i have had a talk with june since and she has allowed me to tell you of his call the man came here between four and five o'clock in spite of myself i started he had left the grounds with a bleeding face little more than an hour earlier he was pale and at one side of his face was a small wound neatly dressed and covered with a small strip of surgeon's plaster he was laboring evidently under some strong mental strain and i was not much surprised when he asked june for a private interview and in such a supplicating manner that she could hardly refuse of course he proposed to her and in a fashion that surprised her his pleading was so desperate his manner so almost fierce he begged her to take time he implored her to reconsider and he went away at last like a man utterly desperate at the last he forgot himself and charged her with caring for an adventurer a penniless fortune hunter who might forsake her at any moment and then he recounted word for word the things said in that conservatory episode the things that were imparted to mr lossing the scoundrel even so this was too much for june's temper she ordered him out of her presence and in going he uttered some strange words the purport of them being that before leaving this place she might find that mr lossing had vanished out of her life and gone back to a more congenial career and that she might be glad to turn to him to beg such favours as no other man could grant and he ended by saying that had she put him in the place of friend and confidant rather than you he might have made straight the crooked places that were troubling the peace of herself and some of her friends i was fairly aglow with excitement when she paused and i told her at once my story of the day's happenings tell miss jenrys i said that i can at the right time explain all the riddles he has astonished her with and ask her to be patient yet a little longer and then i went back to the others to tell mr trent and hilda o'neil that i had now traced the kidnappers of young trent so closely that i had only to sift one block of a certain street to find this gang and i believed their victim and in spite of wonder and question i would tell them no more one of the next morning's papers contained this interesting item followed up by a copy of the letter sent by mr e rowe on the square to mr trent the trent mystery there is hope that the mystery of the disappearance of young gerald trent of boston may soon be cleared up and there is reason for thinking that the enemy is weakening not long since a letter signed by the familiar name of rowe was received by mr trent and promptly handed over to the officers this letter we print herewith mr trent is now in this city and there have been singular discoveries of late it is quite probable that mr trent even now will compromise the matter provided his son is returned to him safe and unharmed 
for strange as it may seem to expose and punish the miscreants it would be necessary to bring into prominence two ladies of fortune and high social standing who innocently and unwittingly have been made to play a part in this strange affair for their sakes doubtless a quiet compromise and transfer will end this most singular affair the row letter reads as follows here of course came the letter which miss o'neil had copied at length for her friend and which in the original had been sent by mr trent to me when this notice had been read by the ladies and by mr trent i was besieged for an explanation of what seemed to them an unwarranted withdrawal from the battle but my purpose once explained they were readily appeased and their faith in me restored it was true that i had tracked the clique to very close quarters but it was one thing to know that in one house out of half a dozen were lodged all or part of the gang but it was another thing to move upon them in such a way as to secure them all and at the same time rescue and save young trent if he were really in that unknown house and really alive it was this problem that was taxing all my ingenuity and which as yet i had not quite solved i had called alone on this afternoon lossing being on guard and when the newspaper sensation had been explained and i was about to go miss ross with whom i had grown quite confidential walked with me to the outer door friend masters she said gently i wish thee could tell me something about young mr lossing the words flung out by monsieur voisin were malicious words and meant to do harm but are they not partly true june is a proud girl but i am sure she feels his reserve of his and he is reserved i love the lad he seems the soul of truth but there is a strangeness a part that is untold my friend you whom we call upon for everything can you not make straight this crooked place too she put out her hand and smiled upon me and her gentle voice was full of appeal and i took the hand and held it between my own while i answered i believe i can do it miss ross and i surely will try and that at once it shall not be all suspense End of chapter 30chapter thirty one of against dots by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter thirty one sir carol ray i was tired with thinking and planning and loss of sleep and that night i led lossing away an easy captive to the gondola station by the art gallery he had been in low spirits all day and had not presented himself at washington avenue since i had told him of voisin's visit there which i did word for word just as miss ross had related it to me and with a purpose he was a reserved fellow and i quite agreed with miss ross it was time for him to throw off his reserve so after i had assured myself that our gondoliers had made no choice collection of pigeon english i began to talk first of voisin and then of june generis suddenly i turned toward him lossing pardon the question but have you ever known voisin previous to your meeting in new york i abstractly why masters well it might easily have been you know a man meets so many when he travels much oh with a short laugh and i you fancy have travelled much why lossing the fact in your case is evident in your manner speech and everything and i went back to voisin and his audacity in addressing miss jenris finishing by calling him a fortune hunting adventurer lossing pulled off his cap and perching it upon his knee turned his fair head to look up and down the waterway and then faced me squarely masters that's precisely what the fellow called me nonsense i said sharply and isn't it true not in my eyes he was silent for a time then masters he began i've been on the point of opening my heart to you more than once 
I am discouraged. I have wooed, yes, and won June Jenris, with hardly a thought of how I could care for her or for myself. Gaz, how thoughtless and selfish I have been! And yet you will think me an ass when I say that, up to this moment, I have never troubled myself nor been troubled about money matters. So help me, heaven, masters! I have never once thought of her fortune or my lack of it in all my wooing of June Jenris. I don't doubt it, I said easily, not in the least. It's not in nature that you should be, at your age, half man and half financial machine. It's contrary to your education. And, smiling inwardly, I began deliberately to fold a cigarette paper. My education? He turned upon me sharply. What? I beg your pardon, masters, but what the deuce do you know about my education? I'm a very observing person, I replied amiably. Haven't you noticed it? He was silent so long that when I had finished making my cigarette and lighted it, I asked, after a puff or two, Lossing, is there anything I can say or do that will help you? I see that you are troubled. If it's money only, bless me, your talents will stand you in money's stead. Brains have a money value in this country, you know. It was more than I at first meant to say. I was treading on delicate ground, and I knew it. Brains? Well, there it is. There's where my education, as you say, stands in the way. It's no use, masters. Our points of view are not the same. To understand mine, you must know what my past has been. That would convince you how little my brain could be relied upon to stand me in lieu of a fortune in this pushing, rushing, electric America of yours. And my story, well, if I am to tell it, I must tell it to her first, and— Good heavens, he groaned, when I have told it, I shall seem to her more like a fortune hunter than even now. He was in the depths, and if I meant to speak first, now was my time. I tossed my cigarette into the water, and sat erect and facing him. What would you give, I asked slowly, if I could show you a way out, a safe and right and happy way? Give? Man alive, I'd give you my gratitude all my life long, first, and after that anything you could ask and I could grant. But, phew, I know you're immensely clever, masters, and I know you're my friend, but... There, don't say anything that you will have to retract, and now I won't presume to advise you, sir, very respectfully, but if I were in your place, I would either go to June Jenris and tell her my whole story, or else let me tell it to her. Let you? And in going, to pave the way if I were you, I would send in my card, and that card should read Sir Carol Ray. The murder was out now, and before he could recover from his surprise, I launched into my story, telling of my chief's letter, and of the one from Sir Hugo Ray which accompanied it, also of the vivid description which set me to staring at all good-looking blondes. My meeting with you in Midway, when you inquired after Miss Jenris so anxiously, was my first clue, I said. On that occasion, I noted that you answered the description very well, also that you were not an American. He looked at me, surprised. Oh, your English is perfect, but it's neither Yankee nor yet Mason and Dixon's English. It's very fine and polished, but it's different. Oh, I never mistook you for an American, Sir Carol Ray. But I might not have given heed to that first clue, had I not read Miss Jenrys's letter to Hilda O'Neill. Then I said, suppose the good-looking guard is this Mr. Lossing, and that Lossing is Ray, and then I began to cultivate you. Ah, I begin to understand. Then, I went on, came other tests. Ray was an athlete. Lossing knocked out a lunchroom beat scientifically. Ray possessed a high and rich tenor voice. So, I found, did Lossing. When? he interposed. On the night you, ahem, <clears throat> fell into the lagoon. I heard you near the bandstand, singing in the chorus. I see. Then, Ray was a fine rider. Lossing can ride also, even a British cavalry nag. 
in fine i studied you from first to last supposing you to be ray a member of the english aristocracy oh i say there you go an american would never say that every word of yours every act pointed to the same conclusion you were all that a young englishman of good family and fortune should be and so sir carroll stop it gives me actual pleasure to find one flaw in your wonderful summing up i am not sir carroll sir hugo my half-brother bears the title and sir hugo and i saw little of each other and were never warm friends one moment sir carroll since that first letter from england my chief has received another sir hugo is dead when he had recovered somewhat from the surprise and shock for a shock it was in truth he told how being left to the guardianship of his elder brother sir hugo was fifteen years the elder he had yet seen little of him sir hugo being seldom at home for long sir hugo's mother the first lady ray died when he was a lad and there were no other children by that marriage he said my mother inherited consumption and three sisters all my elders died in childhood my mother died when i was a babe and i was given to the care of lady lossing my mother's elder and favorite sister i grew to manhood in her house at dulnith hall or in london when sir hugo took possession at last he developed a tyrannical temper he did not choose to marry and so i must do so he selected a wife for me an heiress of course and not too young nor pretty though an english gentlewoman and a fit wife for a king if he loved her which i did not well we quarrelled bitterly i threatened to come to america and he bade me go and never to return while he lived now my father had left me nothing only commending me to sir hugo's generosity which so long as i consulted his wishes was free enough of my own i had a few hundred pounds left me by my mother i took that and came to this country i was introduced into society by a fellow countryman who thought my change of name a mere lark and who soon went home and then straightway i fell in love with june jenris well i said after signalling one of the gondoliers to row us to shore i have showed you the way out have i earned my reward sir carroll ray with a swift movement he caught my hand between both his own best of friends he exclaimed you can never ask of me a favor that i will not grant if given the ability to do so and now and now i echoed as our boat came to the landing there is yet time for you to make that delayed call upon the ladies End of chapter thirty one Chapter thirty two of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter thirty two. Found dead. On the morning of the second day after the publication of the letter signed E. Rowe, I awoke at an early hour after a night passed for the most part in thinking and planning. As the small hours began once more to grow long, and I had reached at last some definite conclusions, I had fallen asleep, but not for long. Sunrise found me awake and astir. Dave had been out all night, and I was eager for his return. I wanted his cooperation and his encouragement. I wanted to tell him my plans, and to hear the result of his night's reconnaissance in the vicinity of the suspected houses. But whatever his success or lack of it my morning's program was laid out I should let no grass grow beneath my feet until I had taken out warrants of arrest for the gang of Charges against them there were enough and to spare But to make my final success more sure it would be best I knew not to alarm them to the extent of letting them see that their deepest and wickedest game was known for this purpose it would be well i knew to take them first upon separate charges greenback bob i decided should be arrested upon the charge of counterfeiting with no specified dates or names delbras we would charge with an attempt to pass counterfeit money 
or with an attempt to swindle farmer camp Smug should figure as a confidence man and the brunette whether appearing as man or woman should be accused of masquerading and To complete the list I would also procure a warrant which should charge monsieur voisin with an assault upon sir carol ray Smiling at the thought of the surprise this last name would occasion I closed my door and was turning the key in the lock when Brainerd came hastily up the stairs and toward me Masters he said hurriedly you're wanted at once come along and Turning he ran back down the stairs and awaited me at the foot What's up? I asked when I had reached his side Dead man was his laconic answer as he caught my arm and hurried me along found this morning I want you to take a look at him Why must I look at him I persisted see if you know him of course and to prevent any further inquisitiveness on my part He began to tell me how the body had been found at early dawn by two honest and early rising Colombian guards lying in the mouth of an alley upon Stony Island Avenue shot I ventured not much strangled he glanced over his shoulder and lowered his voice and the queer thing is Murphy and I were through that same alley from end to end after midnight He was not there then there were four of us within a block of that place all night Neither he nor his assailants could have passed by on the street Ergo I queried ergo being out all night and so near Murphy and I were the first persons the guards met after finding the body so while one of them ran to the station we went to the alley where the other stood on guard the body lay upon ground where ashes had been thrown and thickly too we could see his footprints plainly small they were and others two others one long and slim the other shorter and broader they're covered at this moment with dry goods boxes open end down with a big policeman sitting upon them they couldn't take a cast in those soft ashes Has the body been identified there was nothing upon the body by which to identify but it had not been robbed there was money and valuables in a pocket and a belt I Saw that for some reason Dave did not want to give me further information even if he possessed it and knowing him too well to press my questions I remained silent until we had reached our destination when we were in the presence of the dead and the covering was about to be lifted from the face a Sudden shock and thrill came over me and I hesitated for just an instant Feeling a sudden dread and reluctance at the thought of what I might see yet neither knowing nor guessing Then slowly the officer drew away the covering and I moved a step nearer good heavens there was that natty suit of dark blue the slight and short figure the olive skin and close-cropped hair that I had often seen Do you know him asked Dave? Not by name I replied and then I turned away to collect my thoughts It was the brunette who lay there before me clad now as when last we met at the ferris wheel in the garb of a man there he lay slender and youthful of face and form with the small clean-cut features that had made it so easy to masquerade as a dashing brunette the keen black eyes seen through half-closed lids were staring and inscrutable and the black marks where something had been drawn so tight about his neck as almost to cut into the flesh were horrible to see i do not know his name I again assured the officer in charge I have seen him several times disguised as a woman and once only in the attire in which he now lies dead I have taken note of him as a suspected person and I have believed him to be a man since June the 7th and I related briefly my reasons for this belief but I did not make known my belief in the dead man's connection with the gang of dangerous criminals there was time enough for that nor did I give voice to the belief swiftly taking shape in my mind that he had met his death at the hands of his comrades and Because of the letter I had caused to appear in the morning papers two days before the letter of e row on the square 
The body, of course, must go to the morgue and the coroner, and I told the officer where I might be found or heard of, if wanted for the inquest, and then we withdrew. I was quite sure it was your brunette, declared Dave, now grown communicative. Not by recognition. You know, I only saw her once, and then at some distance. But thanks to the honest guards and ourselves, Murphy and I, that is, the body was not rifled, and I myself helped to search the pockets at the sergeant's orders and to examine the belt he wore. That gave me my clue. In it were half a dozen more of Lausch's dewdrop sparklers, unless I am much mistaken, and two more of the pink topaz lot. He seemed to vary in his way of carrying his treasures. I think I can explain that, I said. When he carried that chamois bag, while disguised as a woman, he meant, no doubt, before laying aside the disguise, to negotiate the sale of them, and so had them in readiness. He carried the emerald, you remember, and the other things he sold and tried to sell, in a little bag, so the tradesman said. Well, said Dave ruefully, one of the gang has slipped through our fingers in a way we did not look for. Have you a theory that will account for this, Carl? I turned upon him almost fiercely. I have, and so have you, Dave Brainerd. I don't for one moment doubt that my mistaken policy has brought this murder about, and you can see how it has complicated things. When I found through the brunette's note, I can't seem to find any other name for him, that in all probability we knew the men who had made away with Trent, I thought the game was almost in our hands, and now— I dropped my head dejectedly. And now we're a good deal mixed, supplemented Dave dryly. We're in a dilemma. It was indeed a dilemma, if no worse. When Miss Jenrys had put that note from the little brunette into my hand, I had opened it with scant interest, for I only desired through this medium to keep, if possible, some trace of her, or him. When I opened the letter and saw the small, sharp, and much slanted handwriting, I almost exclaimed aloud in my surprise. The writing was the counterpart of that of the letter written to Mr. Trent, and opened by his daughter and Hilda O'Neill, the letter proposing a way to liberate Gerald Trent. I could hardly wait until I could compare the two and verify my belief, and then I had at once told my discovery to Brainerd. If the brunette were indeed one of the clique who had kidnapped or murdered Trent, then that clique was composed of the very men we were hunting down, and we were nearer to the truth concerning Gerald Trent than we had dared to hope or dream. It was a great discovery. It put a new face upon everything, and then the question arose, how could we best make use of this new knowledge? How quickest to cure the miscreants, fasten this last, worst crime upon them, and rescue Trent, if he yet lived? And then the previously discussed project of making public the brunette's letter, for the handwritings were identical, and we never doubted that the brunette and E. Rowe were one and the same, and again canvassed. It's the thing to do, Dave had declared. We are close upon the scent, and what we now want is a clue just that they are so secure now they go and come so seldom and with such a system and if we make a dash and do go wrong they are warned and now that we know our men we know that rather than be taken tamely or be betrayed by the presence of a prisoner they would resort to desperate measures let's advertise this mr rowe and his letter it will show them that they have an enemy at home it will disturb their fancied security. They will begin to quarrel among themselves and forget their caution. Some of them will show themselves and show us the way to the rest. What I had counted on was the first clause referring to the young ladies, which I had published after much hesitation. This, more than all else, would tell the man I believed to be at the head of this scoundrel band that he was known. He would understand the meaning of that particular sentence. He might see in it and the rest an actual bid for a compromise, and so become less cautious and vigilant. In fact, as Dave declared, the publication of the letter and its attendant statements was meant for a bait. 
having decided upon this course we had agreed to keep our discovery a secret until we had made this first experiment and while awaiting the results we would not discontinue our efforts to locate our party by which we meant to make sure that our attack when made would find them all or at least the chief personages under one roof for my belief that by devious ways this clique came together regularly if not nightly with their headquarters under one roof and that roof not far away was strong the fact that we were about to exploit the row letter had in itself aroused fresh hopes in the hearts of hilda o'neil and the father of gerald trent and we decided to keep the important fact that the letter had revealed to us between ourselves for a few days it should be known to none but our two selves meantime from those few days we hoped for much we had hoped much and after two days of waiting something had happened indeed the little brunette who had been so mysteriously interested in june jenris who had shown herself and himself an active member of the clique lay dead at the morgue murdered by whom i can't look at it as an unmitigated misfortune declared dave in reply to some of my self-condemnatory moralizing let us admit that the fellow's letter did cause his death wasn't it because he wrote it quite as much or more than because you printed it and even grant you it was your deed all of it haven't you been laboring to get that chap where he could do no more harm mark me if we ever learn who that lad is he will prove to be one of the outlaws that the jail and the halter were especially meant for this i could not doubt and i took such comfort in it as i might of course the detective who had been in search of the brunette was at once summoned through dave and myself and the only information brought out by the inquest was that which between us we gave he was a crook and would have been arrested by myself had he lived upon a charge of masquerading in woman's dress while carrying out illegal schemes corey the only name i shall dare give the clever chicago detective declared the body to be that of a person name unknown for whom he held a warrant upon a charge of robbery and lying dead in the morgue the little brunette was arraigned and proven guilty of participating in the Lausch diamond robbery of world's fair fame and a portion of the spoil was produced as having been found upon his person the jewels were duly turned over to monsieur Lausch, who had now recovered nearly if not quite half of the jewels he had lost these all having been in the possession of the brunette between the event of the morning and the hour of the inquest i had been busy and when it was over i hastened to my room to arm myself with certain papers and intent upon securing the warrants all save one for which i had so lately planned at the door of my room a tall figure awaited me and when i recognized it as that of one of my chief's most trusted standbys who seldom left new york i began to wonder he had been directed to my quarters he said and finding the surroundings to his liking had awaited me there he was not slow in making known his business and he began with the query have you got delbra i had of course sent regular reports to my chief and a week previous had informed him that we were on the trail of the frenchman and i answered not yet but i mean to have a warrant out for him within an hour don't waste your time advised jeffreys i have a warrant and all the necessary extras in my pocket i have been in chicago long enough for that and he made haste to tell me how our chief had lately received from france papers authorizing the arrest of delbra wherever found upon the charge of murder the french police had worked out at last a solution to the mysterious murder in the rue de grammont the victim one laure borin was found in her apartment stabbed in half a dozen places and a tall dark man name unknown was searched for in vain for many weeks at last the crime was traced to delbra through the revelations of a second woman who finding that the man she had believed in hiding had really crossed the ocean and left her behind had at once avenged herself by putting into the hands of the police 
the means by which they had traced the crime home to Delbras. You must not arrest the fellow, Jeffreys had said. Leave that to me. I have everything, extradition and all, and in Paris they'll not fail to execute him. This last argument had its weight. I could not speak with equal certainty of the formality which we call trial by jury, but I began to feel that the fate of the clique, in one way or another, was being rapidly taken out of our hands. One thing was assured. Jeffreys must wait and move with us. Any effort of his to secure Delbras alone would endanger our chances for securing the rest. Before going further with Jeffreys, I felt I must consult Dave. He had left me at noon to go back to Stony Island Avenue, where half a dozen places, each more or less shady, were being constantly watched. Leaving Jeffreys to look at the wonders nearest at hand for an hour, and this he was quite ready to do, I set out in search of my friend and fellow worker, wondering a little what he would think and say of this new turn of affairs. End of chapter 32chapter thirty three of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter thirty three a merciful dispensation as i left the exposition grounds and came out upon stony island avenue i looked at my watch for i had in mind much that i wished to accomplish before night came on it was nearing three o'clock and I hastened my steps Glancing about as I put away my watch in the hope that I might see Billy or Dave as they from time to time shifted their place of observation I saw to my annoyance on the opposite side, but coming toward me almost directly across the street Mrs. Camp Her eyes were fixed upon me and when she had reached the middle of the highway She waved her arm in frantic gesture which in spite of my haste brought me to an instant standstill knowing as i did that she was quite capable of shouting out my name should her signal be ignored as she came nearer i saw that her eyes were staring wildly and her face wore a look so strange and excited that for a moment i feared that the marvels of chicago and the fair had unsettled her reason and her first words did not altogether reassure me if this ain't a merciful dispensation she panted Stopping squarely before me then I don't know what is I was going to hunt you up just as fast as feet could travel And I never expected to be so thankful for knowing a police officer as I be today My Catching her breath and hurrying on if I couldn't have seen a getting the merchants arrested afore night I'd have had a nightmare sure and never slept a wink Mrs. Camp I broke in not so loud, please Ah. Oh. The woman suddenly dropped her loud tone and looked nervously around She was trembling with excitement and the color came and went in her tanned cheeks And now to my surprise I noted dangling from her arm beneath the loose wrap Which she wore very much askew a black something which as she lifted her arm to pass her hand across her twitching lips I perceived was an ear trumpet attached to a long black tube such as is used by the deaf and my fears for her sanity were increased Mrs. Camp I said in a soothing tone you seem exhausted Let me take you to your rooms if they are not too far and you can talk after resting Something in my tone or look must have enlightened her as to my thoughts for she suddenly broke into a short nervous laugh Oh, I ain't crazy Though I don't blame you if you thought so she said with an attempt at composure I was coming to see you and it's important I was going to that Miss Jenrys, but I forgot the number her aunt give me So I struck right out for that office where Adam and me met you that first time and I wanted you arrested right off You know but land I'd be acting like a plum fool come right along She caught my arm and turned me about my place ain't far and I suppose we can't talk in the streets I began to fear that I should not easily escape her and moved on beside her her hand still gripped upon my arm as if for support I Shan't open my head again. She said as she went till we get there and she did not 
but when we had reached her door and i was about to make an excuse and after seeing her safe indoors hasten on in my search for dave she said much more like her usual self come right in now and find out what kind of a detective i'd make if i had the chance it's your business too i guess and then as i seemed to hesitate and it's about that counterfeiting man suddenly somehow the notion of her insanity vanished from my mind and i followed her into the house she opened a door near the entrance and after peeping in threw it wide it's the parlour of the whole family she explained as i entered and i'm thankful it ain't occupied just now for our room ain't more than half as big it was the tiniest of parlours but not ill furnished and the moment she had dragged forward a chair for me after the manner of the country hostess and had made sure that the door was close shut she drew a small rocker close to my own seat and began eagerly i've had an adventure today a regular story-book sort of one it's made me pretty nervous and excited like and i hope you'll excuse that but i'm going to tell it to you the quickest way for unless i'm awful mistook then folks will get out quick so they find out who i be or who i ain't one or t'other my time i began hoping to hasten her story but she went on hurriedly you see camp has got so sudden took up with them machines and windmills and dead folks and dry bones down towards the south pond that he ain't no company for nobody no more so this afternoon we didn't neither one of us go out this morning for we'd been for we'd been to see buffalo bill last night and we was tuckered all out so this afternoon i went with camp down street instead of going the t'other way for he thought twould be a good idea to go in a new gate but somehow when we got there i didn't feel much like going in seemed like twould be such a long tramp and i just left him at the gate and saw to back thinking i'd rest like and be fresh for a good long day tomorrow yes i said as she seemed waiting for my comment i see well i come along slow and right down by well i'll show you the place i'm awful bad by remembering names but when i got more than half way home and was most up to the house that stood close to the street i see the door begin to open real careful at first and then quick and then out of the house came a tall man he didn't look back but i could see there was someone behind him and then the door shut the man came down the steps and then he seemed to see me and almost stopped i tell you i was glad then that i had on these she thrust her hand into her pocket and drew out a pair of those smoked glass spectacles so much affected by sightseers at the fair and i was forced to smile at the strange metamorphosis of her face when she put them on and turned it toward me with the small sharp eyes her most characteristic feature concealed the face became almost a nonentity would you a know me she demanded i think not well i guess he didn't anyhow he gave me a sort of inquiring look and started off ahead of me and who do you suppose he was I shook my head anxious only that she should get on with the story well as sure as my name's hannah camp twas that feller to change the money for camp the foreigner one that i seen in that cairo house the one with the hands but you said yes i know i did but i studied it all over and i weren't mistook not a mite that feller just went through and out the back door and changed his clothes somewhat and come back plain gentleman but i tell you i know them hands twas him i seen coming out of that door to-day are you sure certain sure then wait a moment did you see him go far where did you see him last well there there was an alley next to the house and across that was another house and then a saloon he went into the saloon oh this was the answer i had hoped for pray go on mrs camp i'm going to you know i said there was a man come and shut the door well i got just a glimpse of him at the door and it kind of started me and i came by real slow a looking at the house i noticed that every window in the front was shut and curtains down all but one and that was the front one next the alley that was open half way and the curtain was up i couldn't see inside but just as i came opposite the window 
a man's face popped right out of it for just a minute looking the way the other feller went and then it popped out of sight again but i had seen it square who was it i demanded now thoroughly aroused it was that feller that was so polite to camp and me the time you was arrested the sunday school feller i started to my feet and sat down again she had been doing detective work indeed i thought i could understand it all this was the house we had for days suspected and watched but the only one ever seen to enter it had been greenback bob doubtless the murder of the brunette made them so uneasy that contrary to custom delbra had ventured out by day probably to learn what he could of the movements of the officers i turned to mrs camp mrs camp i began earnestly i am going to confide in you those men belong to a gang of robbers and murderers we have been watching them for weeks fortunately you have come upon them in such a way as to locate their hiding place you can help us very much if you will try to recall everything just as you saw it there and will answer a few questions when you have told your story or is this all all i guess it ain't all and i guess you won't need to ask many questions when i get through i nodded and she went on rapidly when i see that feller dodge back and shut the window i remembered what you had said about him and the others and about their telling me to that office how you was a detective yourself and i just said to myself says i i'm going to try and get another look at that house so i went on past it till i come to a little store and went in and bought ten cents worth of green tea and when i comes out i goes back just as if i was going home with my shopping by the way you ain't seem to notice these new clothes i had noticed the black gown and cape-like mantle she wore both plain but neat and not an ill fit and i had also wondered how she happened to discard her old straw hat with the lopping green bows for the simple dark bonnet she wore but she did not wait for my criticism i'll tell you how come she went on i ain't blind and i'd been a notice in the difference twixt my clothes and some of the rest of em and i was specially took with them plain gowns them ladies wore that you introduced me to that day and i just studied on it and sort of calculated the expense and then went up to the stores i wanted a grey rig like that miss ross had on but i couldn't get none to fit and the young lady told me that a black was dreadful fashionable now so i got this rig and twas lucky i did to-day what could she mean by this diversion i was growing uneasy when she uttered the last words yes i said feebly i suppose you wonder what i'm driving at she queried well it's coming you see i was wearing these clothes and the goggles as i call them when i was sauntering past that house but i hadn't got to it nor even to the saloon yet when a cab one of them two-wheeled things you know with a man sitting up behind to drive i nodded well it drove up and the man opened the door right in front of that house and out got a woman she was bigger than me and all dressed in black and she looked sort of familiar and just as i was wondering who she made me think of and she was a paying the driver up comes another cab tearing and out hopped two fat red-faced policemen and there was a little squabble like and the woman flung herself round so that i could see her face and then i knew her she paused as if for comment but i was now too much amazed for words i knew her in a minute she resumed and it was that woman that come striding into that rug place in cairo street that day she hadn't no long swinging veil on this time and she didn't look nigh so big alongside them big policemen she'd give up quiet enough when she seen she had to and they put her into the cab and drove away with t'other one behind em i walked pretty slow so as not to come right into the rumpus and i thought as i come across the alley that i seen something a layin by the sidewalk on the outside i looked round and seein that very last window was as dark as black i stooped down to look at the things and here they are and she shook out with one hand a long black veil which she had drawn from her pocket and held out with the other the snake-like speaking tube i can see you're in a hurry she said dropping the veil and tube into her lap and i'll get to the point now right off 
I wa'n't never no coward, and I just ached to find out what them fellers was up to. Maybe if I'd stopped to think, I wouldn't have run the risk. But while I stood there with them things in my hand, an ID popped into my mind, I looked round, and there wasn't a soul near me, and the windows was all dark, so that nobody could see me from the house, and of course they hadn't seen the woman get arrested and took away. We didn't look much alike, but I thought maybe they'd let me in, thinking twas her, and when I got in, I'd tell them I'd found a trumpet at the door, and perhaps, if I felt like it, I'd say I'd seen a gentleman to the window that I was acquainted with, that is, if he didn't come to the door. Anyhow, I thought I'd try to make sure it was him I see at the window. I shuddered at her cool recital of such a daring venture, and yet I could see how, with her country training, she would see nothing so very serious or dangerous in thus thrusting herself into a strange house, gossip-like, to find out what was going on. She took up the trumpet. I was used to these things, she said, for my aunt on my mother's side used to live with me. She was an old maid, and she used one. Stone deaf she was almost, but I didn't think then o' using this. When I got onto the top step, I felt most like running off all of a sudden, but I set my teeth and gave the bell a jerk. Twan't long before the door opened just a crack, and I see a eye looking out. I meant to get inside before I said anything, so I kind of give the speaking trumpet hanging over my arm a shake it was most hid under my veil you know and then the door opened wider and i see a woman my the palest woe woman i'd ever seen most oh she says in a shaky scared sort of voice come in quick she looked so peaked and strange i just stood staring at her a minute and all at once she reached out her hand and motioned to me and as i stepped in she caught hold of the big end of the speaking trumpet and then I see that she thought I was deaf. And quick as a wink, it come to me to play deaf as long as I could. Deaf folks are always making blunders, and then to apologize and get out. So I stuck the tube to my ear. You're the nurse, she says through it, but not very loud, for a deaf person, that is. Louder, says I. So she said it real loud, and I nodded. Then she motioned me to come into the room to the front that I had seen the man look out of. It was most dark there, only there was a window on the alley that appeared to be all boarded up, only just a slit to the top to let a little streak of light in. Sit down a minute, she says, and when she let go of the trumpet, her hand shook so that I could see it. She opened the door in the back of the room, and I see there was a screen on the other side, so I couldn't see the room, but I got up and tiptoed to the door. The carpet was awful thick there and in the hall though it was old enough too she hadn't shut the door tight and i heard her say wake up bob and then a sort of question and she says again the nurse has come after all and you can go and sleep now then i heard a man say what made the old gal so late blast her eyes i'd have given her a good old blessing if she wasn't such a crank-mouthed jade and then he seemed to be stirring and i most thought he was coming in but then he says get her in here then get me something to eat. I can't sleep when I'm so holler. Won't you come in and speak to her, Bob, says the woman, and tell her about the medicine? I'm so tired. Then I was scared again, though I declare I felt sorry for that poor critter of a woman. But the man snarled at her and said, No, I won't. I'm tired as you be. Hustle now and bring me the grub mighty quick. I scooted back to my chair then and in a minute or so she came in and motioned me to come into the other room. I see they had mistook me for some deaf nurse, and I'd begun to think I'd grabbed more than I could hold, and to wish I was out. But I went in, and if ever a woman was struck all of a heap, t'was me. She paused, as if mentally reviewing the scene once more, and I fairly quivered with anticipation and anxiety for what the next words might develop. I had noticed that there was windows on the alley side of the house, she resumed, and there being only one in the front room. Of course, I looked to see one sure in this, and maybe two, and there wasn't a window. The wall on that side was smooth, only at the window place was a kind of cupboard arrangement like, and the room was lit by a kerosene lamp. It was furnished quite good, too, but in a corner on a bed lay a young man, as good looking about as they make em only he was dreadful pale and thin and he appeared to be sleeping there's your patient said the woman through the tube 
there ain't nothing to do now only to give him drink and not let him talk if he wakes he sleeps a good deal and when he wakes up he's out of his head and imagines he's somebody else he and ain't in his own house and all sorts of nonsense she went to the bed and stood looking at the sick man in a queer sort of way and she give a big long breath as if she felt awful bad and then went out by a door that i knew went to the hall and i heard noises in a minute more as if they come from the kitchen stove now i knowed she took me for a nurse and all that but all the time i began to think i'd better get out i couldn't play nurse and ask about that sunday school feller too and i thought i just made a big blunder and i'd better get out without waiting for her to come back and just then i heard a little noise and i looked round and the sick man had rolled over and was looking at me straight and then he catched my eyes he says come here madam please Twas a real pleasant voice though weak and I went right up to the bed he looked at me real sharp and sort of wishful and then he says you look like a good woman I didn't say nothing and he kept right on sort of hurried like I was not asleep when you entered he says and I heard that poor woman I am not insane and this is not my home you have come here to nurse me but if you want money you can earn a hundred nurses fees by going to a telegraph office and telegraphing to just then there was a noise in the hall and he stopped and i picked up a fan and stood as if i was a fanning away a couple of little moths that the lamp had drawed nobody came in so i went to the door and listened it seemed as if i heard a door shut upstairs and i guessed the woman was taking up the cross man's dinner so i went back to the bed he laid still for a bit and seemed to be listening then he says i am a prisoner and have been half killed first and then drugged to keep me so my people are wealthy they will pay you royally if you'll help me and you'll go to the nearest police station and give them a paper i will give you with my father's name and he stopped again and shut his eyes quick as lightning and the next minute the pale woman came in quick and looking awful anxious she went to the bed and looked at the sick young feller and then she took hold of the trumpet and motioned me to listen can you hear she says into it not very loud i nodded and looked towards the bed he sleeps real sound she said and won't be likely to wake up anyhow i can't leave him alone to talk to you in another room there's something i forgot and some of them may come in any time now will you do a wretched woman a small kindness she looked at me awful wishful when she said that and i nodded my head again they told me not to let you in unless you gave me a card and i I am so troubled I forgot to ask for it at the door will you give me the card now and please not give me away to the boys I can't stand no more trouble I I think it was your being so late made me forget why was it for a minute I was stumped and then an idea came to me to tell the truth I says as bold as you please I've been in a little trouble and I forgot that card you see I had to come off put in here on account of a couple of policemen that was on the lookout for me I've only just given the slip You see I thought when she heard that she'd make allowance for the card and I wanted to talk more with that sick boy For I believed he was telling the truth But my she jumps up looking scared to pieces and she says the police Do you think they will follow you can they merciful goodness? We can't risk it. I'm almost broke down, but I'll call up Bob and you must go right away Don't you see it won't do she snatched a key out of her pocket come she says mercy what a risk i had took off my glasses and laid them on the table by the bed i picked up me black veil i had dropped on the chair and just as she went to take the key out of the hall door she had to turn her back to do it i went to the table and took up my glasses and tried to catch that poor boy's eye and make him a sign but my he laid there with his eyes shut and such a look of misery upon his poor face and all at once it struck me that i hadn't spoke once and that he hadn't noticed the trumpet till the woman come in and then he thought he'd been a begging help of a deaf woman but i hadn't no chance then and as soon as she picked out the key she says i'll have to let you out front it won't do to risk your being seen coming out by any other way the way was clear when i got out but i most dreaded meeting one of them men somers and i just started straight to find you one moment i said hurriedly as she now ceased you spoke of miss jenrys 
why did you think of going to her why she was the nearest of anybody and i thought you was as likely as not to be there End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson chapter thirty four eureka at twelve o'clock p m a party of men had gathered not far from the house where mrs camp had made her singular discoveries they came singly and by twos from various directions and their movements were so quiet as not to have disturbed the lightest of sleepers however near for with one exception all were trained to the business in hand when two of the party had made a careful reconnaissance of the premises they returned to the waiting group there's the door and two windows at the front said one and three windows on the alley the middle one as we know boarded on the inside at the back is a door opening upon a sort of shed and a window in the same and in the angle formed by the shed and the rear of the house proper is another window on the inner side opposite the alley the wall is blank there's no bed in the front room the speaker went on rapidly though someone may bunk there of course there is a watcher in his room two of you must patrol the alley while brainerd cuts out a pane or two of that closed-up alley window to see if anything can be heard through the cracks of those inside boards though it's probable they are padded to deaden sound as for the upper rooms they're sleeping there doubtless and don't forget interposed brainerd in a low half whisper about those iron hooks outside those back windows they're for something more than signalling they're stout enough to support a rope with a man at the end and the rope and the man are both inside no doubt four to the back then i said and you jeffreys take the lead three to the alley you and two others dave if the thing's not accessible divide to back and front lossing can you and murphy hold me on your shoulders while i try that window now all to our places and there ought to be a train soon over there let's do our cutting under cover of its noise the illinois central railway was but a little distance from us and we took our places to await the sound of its first train but fortune having baffled and hindered us again and again seemed now to have relented toward us before trying the window i crept up the steps to examine the lock of the door and judge if i could of its security lossing as he still preferred to be called and murphy the policeman were standing below me one on either side of the steps and as i stood at the door above them i turned and looked about me all seemed quiet up and down that often unquiet street and the lights from either direction hardly served their purpose there a fact which had been considered doubtless in making choice of this place it was after midnight now and as i heard far away yet the first faint rumble of the train i put my hand upon the handle of the door was it imagination or did i feel a responsive touch upon the other side i let my hand rest lightly upon the knob and waited then suddenly as the rumble of the train came nearer i sprang down the steps and crouching at the side of lossing whispered across to murphy lay low and be ready someone's coming out there was no time for more words but i never doubted the readiness of my two helpers nor their quick comprehension of the situation as the rumble of the train came nearer the door opened almost without noise and shut again and softly slowly looking up and down the street but not below him almost within reach a man came down the steps paused an instant and stood upon the pavement to feel before he could turn his head a hard grip upon either arm a cold pressure at the back of his neck and simultaneously a low whisper one sound and you are a dead man it was all the work of an instant and so quickly and quietly done that our friends in the alley were not aware of our capture until we had secured our prisoner and lossing had gone to summon dave then still in utter silence we led our first capture across the alley and murphy flashed a dark lantern in his face it was a pallid and cowardly countenance that the light revealed 
and I was not surprised to recognize the man I had dubbed smug upon the day of my arrival at the World's Fair. He was trembling violently and thoroughly cowed. We had no difficulty in searching his pockets. He did not so much as remonstrate, perhaps because of the pistol I had now transferred to the hand of Lossing. By the light of the dark lantern, I selected from among a number of keys taken from his pocket a slender one, which, as it only needed the look upon his face to tell me, was the key to the street door. Listen, I said to him, holding the lantern high. It will be to your interest to help us out, and you will find it so if you help to make what we are about to do as easy and quiet as possible. We know who are in that house, and if we can take them without noise and trouble, so much the better for them. The place is surrounded. They can't escape us. Is anyone in the front room, lower floor? He shook his head sullenly. You were put there on guard, is it not so? He blinked under the lantern's rays, and I saw that I was right. And you thought it would be quite safe to slip out for an hour or two. And so it would have been last night, or the one before. Now, is Delbras on the second floor front? You had better tell me. He nodded sullenly. And Bob, remember your answers can't injure their case, and will benefit yours. My word is good. Is Greenback Bob there? Again the sullen fellow bowed his head. And how many more, exclusive of your prisoner? The rascal started, and seemed taken with a new panic. You had better be quite frank, I admonished. How many? He held up three fingers, as well as the handcuffs would permit, and a moment later we had left him at the mouth of the alley, guarded by two officers, while we arranged for our attack. One man was left to guard the rear, with full instructions covering any and all possible emergencies, and one was told off to guard the front entrance, while the remaining six were paired, lossing with myself at his own request, Dave and one officer, and Jeffreys with another. Murphy we had left with Smug, and in charge of the party without. Masters, lossing said, I want to be with the man that attacks Delbra. I owe it to him. When Jeffreys had heard him, he declared Delbra his prey. But I also had my word to say. Jeffreys might serve his warrant and bear off the captive from the city, but he could only take him when I had failed. And so it was arranged. When all was ready, we waited, six of us, upon the steps of the gloomy house, until after what seemed an hour, and was in reality ten minutes, had passed. And then a long freight train came rumbling cityward. As it came near, I inserted the key in the lock carefully and turned it slowly and without noise. And while the sound still covered our careful movements, we entered the hall, leaving the officer in charge of the door. Then, when Dave and his companion had entered the front room and stood ready to move upon the watcher through the door behind the screen, trusting the other door to the watchful eye of the guard at the front, we crept upstairs, with that sideward movement which ensures one who has the patience to try it, a silent, if slow, passage, to the top, in single file. At the top we separated, and we, Lossing and myself, took our places at the door near the front. Jeffreys listened at the two rear doors, to make sure of the location of his prey, and at a signal, which the guard below passed on to Dave, we moved each armed with a dark lantern to the attack i could hear lossing's breath close beside me as i carefully and slowly tried the knob of the door and found that it yielded silently the house was an old one and we saw as we slowly opened the door that the lock was only a fragmentary one there was on the other side only a handle like that without holding our lanterns low we glided in and were halfway across the room when I raised the lantern and turned its light carefully toward the bed, from whence long guttural breathing told of a sleeper unconscious of our nearness. With lantern in one hand and pistol in the other, I made a forward step as I saw by the ray thrown across the bed the form and face of Delbra, and then, suddenly, beneath my foot, something cracked and burst with a sharp explosion. Only a parlour match, but it brought the sleeper to a sitting posture and broad awake in a moment 
he did not seem to so much as have seen me but his eyes and lossings appeared to meet and challenge each other and quicker than i can tell it he had bounded from his bed snatching something from under the pillow as he sprang something that glittered in his hand as he hurled himself upon lossing and the two grappled and swayed with the knife gleaming above their heads held thus by the strong hand of the english athlete as i sprang to place my lantern upon the table at the bed's head that it might help me to see and to aid lossing a shriek rang from the room at the rear and the next moment i saw the knife sent flying from the hand of delbra and the two go down still struggling a moment i watched them struggling there and then somehow the villain wrenched one hand free and gripped it with an awful clutch upon glossing's throat the next there arose from below a succession of screeches that might have issued from the throat of a bedlamite once and again i had tried to interfere in lossing's behalf but the effort seemed useless until as the screams from below ceased suddenly i sprang past the two and turning suddenly struck at delbra with my clubbed pistol i had aimed at the arm clutching at my friend's throat but a sudden movement brought the villain's head in sharp contact with the butt of the pistol and his hold suddenly relaxed and he lay stunned and at our mercy when lossing not much the worse for his tussle but somewhat short of breath had arisen and shaken himself together i said he's only stunned and will soon come too shoot him if he stirs before i come back and i ran to the room in the rear what had happened there can be soon told when jeffreys opened the door of the rear room which did not boast a lock he saw a lamp burning dimly upon a shelf in a corner upon the bed opposite a woman and a man both sleeping and under the one window a coil of rope ladder as if ready for use the face of the woman was ghastly pale and her sleep must have been very light for suddenly she opened her eyes and seeing the officer uttered the cry which at first only caused her lord and master to growl out an oath and turn over whereupon she clutched at him wildly and cried to the men to leave them they would give themselves up if only the officer would withdraw and permit them to rise and dress the man meantime seemed to awaken slowly and to be dazed and stupid and he paid little heed to his wife's cries as he dragged himself to a sitting posture you'd better get up said jeffreys sternly and give up you're all in for it possibly the shrieks that came from below at that moment convinced him for he answered with a scowling face i guess i know when i'm beat if you'll shut the door or turn your back so my wife can get up i'll be quiet enough shut up sue all right said jeffreys and the two officers drew back from the door and jeffreys drawing it half shut said with his eye upon the man now the lady first and pistol in hand he waited the one window was opposite the door and the bed close beside it so that the half closed door concealed from jeffreys both window and woman he heard her spring up and at the instant almost a slight scraping sound then suddenly at the very moment when i stepped from the farther room the light went out there was a bound an oath a shrill whistle and as i reached the door the flash of a bull's-eye and two pistol shots came close together as i sprang into the room the light revealed an open window with the rope ladder half out half in and upon the floor beneath it greenback bob with jeffreys kneeling upon his breast and the attendant officer with pistol aimed and bull's-eye in hand at his head upon the bed weeping and moaning piteously lay the woman her face buried in the pillow i went to her and put her hand upon her arm she lifted toward me the most woeful face as it has ever been my lot to see and said with mournful apathy don't fear i don't want to escape i knew the end must be near and she dropped back with an air of utter exhaustion upon her pillow i turned to assist jeffreys in securing greenback bob who now that his pretence of stolid apathy had failed him was an ugly customer to deal with and who was resisting with all his strength and filling the air with blasphemy it was necessary to secure him hand and foot and we had but just completed the task when dave came bounding up the stairs eureka he cried it's a complete catch 
and Trent's alive and the happiest man in Chicago or the world. Hello! He had glanced at the prostrate counterfeiter, and his last exclamation was in answer to a voice from the room where I had left Lossing guarding the senseless Delbra. Following Dave's significant gesture, I went with him to the door of the room, where, to my surprise, Delbra, his face quite bloodless with rage and weakness together, was slowly dressing himself under the sternly watchful eye and steadily aimed pistol of Sir Carroll Ray. The latter had gathered the garments together while Delbra lay unconscious, keeping a watchful eye and ready weapon the while, and had placed them close at his side, first removing from a pocket a small sheathed knife, and now, with his own weapon in hand and those of Delbra collected on the table at his side, he was compelling the Frenchman to make his toilet at the point of the pistol, and his set face left in the mind of the enraged and baffled rascal no room to doubt him when he said, Unless you have put on those garments within a reasonable time, I will call a pair of policemen to dress you, and if you make one sound or movement other than in obedience, I will shoot every bullet in this weapon into your body and do it with pleasure. How was it? I asked Dave while his toilet was proceeding, and we stood ready for the trick or attempt at resistance we more than half expected from the Frenchman. I guess you heard it about all. Trent lay there wide awake, mighty blue, and too weak to lift his head, and a big negress was half dozing in her chair by the bedside, with a pistol at her elbow. She made a grab for it and yelled, as you probably heard. Trent was assaulted and half killed, nursed back to life. For what there was in it and has just come to his senses awfully weak but game enough to resist their efforts to make him appeal to his father for a big ransom that's all i've had time to hear end of chapter 34、Chapter、35 of against odds by lawrence l lynch this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Lynn Thompson, Chapter Thirty Five. After all, Trent, of course, was not strong enough to be moved, and that, and the late or rather the early hour, it being now almost two o'clock a.m., decided us to camp down in the house until morning. So the men outside, with Smug in charge, were called in, and with our prisoners securely guarded, we passed the few hours before daylight in conversation. Dave, Jeffreys, Lossing, and myself in Trent's room. I was doctor enough to see that the poor fellow had been sufficiently startled by our appearance and the events of the night, and so, eager as we were to hear and he to tell his story, we imposed silence upon him until he could be seen by a physician, at least comparative silence, and as he declared himself all right except for his weakness. And finding that he was very naturally unable to sleep or even to rest quietly, we told him briefly the story of our search for him, and in telling it led him slowly to the knowledge of his father's presence in the city and the nearness of his betrothed. More than once his fine eyes filled with tears, and his lips trembled as we told of his sweetheart's telegrams and his father's anxiety, and when he had heard it all, He lay a long time silent but wakeful, and evidently thinking, and at last, just as the first faint streak of grey became tinged with a beam of red in the east, he fell asleep, with a smile upon his pale lips. When the negress had been removed from the room, she had begged to be taken to her dear Mrs. Susie, who, she declared, was sick enough to die, and I led her upstairs to the room where the pale, worn woman still lay. In the room from which her husband had been removed. As the negress entered the room, the woman lifted her head, and with an inarticulate cry threw herself into her servant's arms. There was a moment of wild sobbing, and then, as I was about to set a guard at the door and withdraw, the negress uttered a shrill cry, caught the slender form in her stout arms, and laid her upon the bed, and I saw a thin stream of blood trickle from between the white lips. Restoratives were at hand, for this was not the first attack, the negress said, and when the woman had been cared for, and at last lay sleeping from exhaustion and, I fancied, the help of an opiate, I questioned the servant. 
her mistress she said was a southern woman and she had been her servant since before the war when that mistress was a child of six an orphan with a small fortune mistress susie had married greenback bob master robert she called him and had followed him and clung to him through all his downward career of crime as the big heavy-featured colored woman had clung to miss susie when prosperous bob was kind when unlucky or drunk he was cruel and coarse mrs susie had inherited consumption and that and trouble and danger had won her life away as the woman said with big tears dropping upon her dark cheeks this last she concluded has been the worst of all and that sick boy mrs susie prayed em to let him go away to the hospital when he was hurt and couldn't give any one away but they never heard to miss susie never they wouldn't have been trapped like this if they had it was by my proposal to bring the physician whom at an early morning hour i summoned to see trent to pass judgment upon mrs susie also that i won the negress to tell me something about trent how at early evening he was brought in by bob and delbra whom she called hector and whom she evidently both feared and hated how a physician was called as the young man was insensible and how fortunately for them he continued delirious for three weeks and more while the two wounds on his head both serious ones were healing how the gang had deliberately taken the risk of keeping him until he had so far recovered as to be beyond the danger line knowing that they could not safely negotiate the return to his family of a prisoner who might die perhaps while the negotiations were pending she told how some one of the gang proper was always on guard in the sick-room by day and often by night and that it was only since the going away of one of the gang harry by name that they had entrusted the prisoner to her care alone it did not take me long to find out that the person she called harry was the brunette now lying dead at the morgue and i saw too that she did not dream of the fate that had overtaken him although i felt sure that the woman susie did at early dawn the three men delbra bob and smug or harris as his companions called him were taken away under charge of dave brainerd and jeffreys to be locked up and safely kept until jeffreys should take delbra to new york and thence to france the others would await our appearance against them when the physician came i took him from young trent's bedside to that of mrs susie of trent he had spoken only words of cheer his wounds were healing had healed in fact healthily and with no danger of after trouble mental or other and now he needed only good nursing good food tonics stimulants and for a little longer quiet and not too much company he might be moved he told us upon a cot and for a short distance that afternoon and he commended us for our wisdom in not following up the excitement of the previous hours with an instant meeting between the invalid and his father and sweetheart now after a light breakfast and a good nerve tonic he might see his friends when they had been prepared and warned against unduly taxing the patient's nerves and strength of the sick woman above stairs there was a different tale to tell she might linger for weeks but for her there was no recovery when the negress hat her mistress called her heard this she was inconsolable and when i had promised her that if possible she should remain with her mistress to the end she was ready to be my slave and knowing that nothing could help or hurt her mistress more she was willing to tell me what she could about the gang and their methods she had no love for her mistress's husband and she seemed to have remembered against him every unkind deed or word spoken or done to her mrs susie delbra she had ever feared and hated and smug she despised as the coward decoy for the gang for harry she expressed a liking he was bad that's true she declared sharp as you please and tricky but he was good to my mistress when the others forgot her he was good to her always and he bought her books and fruit when he dressed in woman's clothes she would help him and he never forgot to thank her but they quarrelled harry and bob and the frenchman and he left night before last i told her of harry's fate and she cursed his slayers with oaths like a man's and after that her testimony was ready and it helped us much 
as for susan kendricks for this was the name by which the poor soul had wedded greenback bob there came a time when she told me her story and a sad sad page it was with little light anywhere upon it she had taken little part in their dangerous enterprises only now and then appearing somewhere with harry when he was masquerading as a girl in order to mislead the officers or the neighbors in their estimate of the number and sex of the gang or to play a part as on the night when she personated june jenris in order to entrap lossing but when the ships in port who cares to wait for the furling of the sails the journey ended we go ashore little need to describe the meeting between gerald trent and his friends which occurred shortly after the going away of the gang and the visit of the doctor he told them the story of his disappearance and the manner of it was briefly thus at one of the small tables in the public comfort cafe he had dined opposite smug whose confiding and kindly obliging manner and general air of being a good but rather slow young man made him an invaluable decoy for the gang here trent's rather careless display of a well-filled purse together with the fine watch he carried and his valuable diamonds quietly but mistakenly worn had no doubt attracted smug who had made himself agreeable but not obtrusively so and had contrived to meet him again and yet again the last meeting was at evening when while chatting easily he had expressed a desire to visit buffalo bill and smug claiming to be a near resident very modestly offered his escort and was so unobtrusive and so eminently proper while confessing to a weakness for horse shows that trent had been quite disarmed at the close of the entertainment the elevated trains being overcrowded smug had carelessly recommended the central alleging that one of its suburban stations was little more than two blocks away and proffered himself as guide as an afterthought and because he could show him a short cut he showed me several concluded trent with a grimace for having lured me away from the crowd and into an almost deserted and ill-lighted street we were suddenly attacked and my short cuts were administered upon my crown some hazy remembrance caused him to believe that they had taken him to their lair half carrying and half dragging him and representing him to an inquiring policeman as being a victim of too much brandy and beer then came his illness a dream of fever pain and delirium and a slow return to reason to find himself a prisoner too weak to lift head or tend and yet fully determined not to help his rapacious captors to a fortune at his father's cost since his return to reason he had as much as possible rejected what he believed to be opiates and had feigned sleep to avoid their threats and importunities and to meet cunning with cunning while thus sleeping he had heard some of their whispered plotting and he was able to explain how it was that mrs camp had succeeded in carrying out her wild but successful venture against smug's acquaintances was a certain widow or a woman who passed for such and called herself a nurse and whose services came high however she was one of the right sort who asked no questions and always obeyed orders upon the night of harry's disappearance there had been an unusual commotion in the house and a recklessness of speech quite uncommon and before morning it was decided that smug should secure the services of this valuable nurse at an early hour as they must have another hand before noon smug had reported the arrival of the nurse at an early hour and the fact that she was hard of hearing was counted in her favour smug had further said to the satisfaction of delbras who by the by had never entered trent's room without first assuming the disguise of an elderly foreigner that the woman was especially willing to come because of a little difficulty with the cops who were too attentive for comfort thanks to the successful attention of these same cops the woman had left in mrs camp's hand the means whereby she might penetrate this stronghold of iniquity and so be enabled to do what we had schemed and planned to accomplish and but for her might have made only a partial success mrs camp was the heroine of the hour and we bent to her our diminished heads and willingly declared her a detective indeed for while we had fathomed the disguises of the gang and tracked them home it was her masterly coup 
that had made of our raid the assured success which it was to say that mrs camp was made much of by hilda o'neil june jenris and miss ross is to put it mildly and the good woman cared far more for the petting and praise of the two pretty girls than for the gratitude and congratulations of all the rest of us and the friends she has found through her singular raid upon smug and company will be her friends for all the years to come how i established a connection between the crook delbra and the fine gentleman who had taken new york society by storm as monsieur maurice voisin was a wonder to many until i had laid before them the process of reasoning by which it was done i had entered the classic fairgrounds intent upon searching among the many faces for two one a blond young englishman the other a dark and handsome frenchman and a letter picked up in the crowd had given me a mental photograph of these two though i knew it not before i had ever seen voisin i had said of him mentally i believe he has tricked miss june jenris and young lossing then i saw him in company with miss jenris that day before our meeting and i could not help seeing how perfectly he answered the description of delbra next we met and i could not believe in him and the glimpses of greenback bob's disguised companion in midway as agent and fakir all were wonderfully like monsieur voisin man of fashion and so from day to day i had watched him as he sought to dazzle the eyes of sweet june jenris hoping for the time when i might unmask him before her then came the attack upon lossing at the bridge in which we both saw the hand of voisin mrs camp too added her quota to the solution of this riddle when she recognized in voisin the swindler of the turkish bazaar and identified the hand of voisin as the hand which had held out the spurious banknotes to camp and finally there came his second attempt to destroy lossing at the cold storage fire ending as it did in his own disaster and revealing to me the scar upon the temple so minutely described in the chief's letter as belonging to delbra the man had maintained a solid indifference and a stubborn silence after his arrest even when he learned how complete was his exposure both as voisin and delbra before his departure for new york a complete record of his misdeeds so far as we knew them was made and put into the hands of jeffreys the man smug or harris as might have been expected was willing to betray his companions in crime now that he knew himself safe from such vengeance as had been meted out to harry the brunette and in the hope of such measure of immunity as is sometimes bestowed upon the rascal who confesses the evil deeds of his associates it was by his testimony that we fixed the theft of monsieur lausch's diamonds upon the gang and the attack upon lossing or sir carroll ray upon delbra and bob and it was through hat the negress first and then from smug when sharply questioned that we learned of their last and vilest plot which was to obtain the ransom of trent if possible or to put him out of the way if this failed and then with their hands free to purchase a small yacht and to kidnap miss jenris keeping her out in the lake until she should buy her release by marrying delbra the only time when delbra was seen to blench or appear other than the stolid sullen and silent criminal was when miss jenris accompanied by her aunt was obliged to appear and identify him as the man who had masqueraded as monsieur voisin then indeed his dark face paled his eyes fell before hers and he turned away with bowed head clearly such love as such a man can feel had been laid at the feet of queenly june jenris who had learned the truth concerning him with amazement horror and loathing while the body of the brunette harry lay at the morgue a tramp strange to the police and to the city viewed it with the many others who gloat over the horrors of life and who having looked long and with a startled face pronounced the body to be that of a professional thief long wanted by the authorities out west he was a born bad un the man declared and a born thief he couldn't stay anywhere long on that account i'll bet he's picked more pockets than any lag at the fair he was a slick one like the women and most generally had a lot of friends among them wherever he was 
and he most generally left em the poorer when he got ready to quit little kid that's what they used to call him cause he was little and good looking but there wasn't a decent hair in his head and the tramp turned away with a malevolent look at the dead man and that was all we could learn about harry for smug ready to talk on all other subjects would utter no word as to the manner of harry's death he had left them that was all he would say and by this we knew that smug was doubtless the decoy who had lulled the suspicions of the victim and made it possible for his bolder spirits to do the deed of death delbras was taken to france and before the closing of the great fair had met his fate at the hands of the french executioner greenback bob and smug might have spent all their days in prison if they had possessed three lives apiece so many were the counts against them their trials were separate and came about after weeks of delay there were no friends with long purses to influence the jury and unless that elastic pardoning power is stretched for their benefit as has sometimes happened in similar cases greenback bob and smug will employ their future time honestly and for the good of the race sir carroll ray had a very fair reason for remaining in america for a time and so placing the business of his newly acquired estates in the hands of the london solicitor who had been sir hugo's legal adviser he remained at the world's fair city where with minds unburdened the entire party with at first the exception of gerald trent who was rapidly recovering in spite of the overwhelming attentions of his friends took up the much interrupted and pleasant employment of seeing the world's fair with eyes that saw no flaws even in the government building the trents did not linger when the invalid was well enough to travel but hastened to the home where mrs trent an invalid still but a happy one awaited her son's return impatiently after the long weeks of suspense there are no weddings in this tale of strange happenings which nevertheless are not more strange than many of the unwritten annals of the fair but when the early autumn came two pairs of lovers chaperoned by a discreet little quakeress renewed their acquaintance with the court of honour loitered in the shadows of the peristyle drifted upon the lagoon and pacing its length recalled anew the strange adventures and experiences of that wonderful impossible kaleidoscopic yet utterly and charmingly real midway pleasance the end end of chapter 35 end of against odds by lawrence l lynch read by lynn thompson in the willamette valley